Welcome to Just a Minute. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute walls fades away, once more it's my huge pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country, but around the world, but also to welcome to the program for exciting personalities who are going to speak for just a minute on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. And they are seated on my right, Paul Merton and Pam Ayres, and seated on my left, Graham Norton and Rufus Hound. Please welcome all four of them. <laughs> Beside me is Hayley Sterling. She's going to help with the score. She's going to blow the whistle when the 60 seconds have elapsed. So we begin the show with Paul Merton and the subject, Paul, optimism. Tell us something about optimism in just a minute, starting now. There's a star man waiting in the sky. He'd like to come and meet us, but he'd think he'd blow our minds. When fans of David Bowie listen to his music, they were given a sense of optimism. He's... Oh. <laughs> I, I was going to say music again. I suddenly got serious. <laughs> Graham, you challenged first. Well, I feel awful for challenge, but he did stop. Absolutely. It wasn't my fault. He no, stopped. I was a well, it, was, it was a big old hesitation. It was. It was a definite hesitation. I was yes, going to suggest I... a minute's silence, but... Uh... <laughs> I think that deserves a bonus point, that really. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anyway, Graham, a correct challenge. You get a point for that. You take over the subject. There are 49 seconds available. Optimism starting now. If you meet someone over the age of, say, 30 who claims to be an optimist, I'll wager they aren't. What they are, in fact, is an idiot. <laughs> they claim that hope triumphs over experience. But all that says to me is I've met a man or woman who has refused to learn the lessons that life is trying to teach them. Optimism is fine in the young, but then it wears thin. You look at someone like Jerry Hall. Is she an optimist? I don't know. I'm guessing that in her heart, she is hoping something, and that he doesn't... Paul, you challenged. I think she's marrying a man who's 84, so she's fairly optimistic. <laughs> That's a very good challenge, isn't it? Yeah, not bad. <laughs> so, Paul, we, we say that's a correct challenge. And uh, you have... Wait a minute. <laughs> Let's just recap. There's deviation, there's hesitation and repetition. Which one was that? Um... <laughs> deviation. Was it? Well, because she Jerry must... Hall is optimistic. The subject is optimism. But isn't that his challenge? But to I, marry was to a... I was talking about her. <laughs> Subject. But in fairness, you sound as if you're a jilted lover. I'm not sure he's <laughs> Rupert or Jerry are to blame. <laughs> well, I Rupes. understood his challenge to be she must be optimistic if she marries this man of 84. Therefore, I'm talking about her yes. when the subject is optimism. I think, I think he's right. I think he's right. Yeah. All right. But you're very good. If you see a picture of Mick Jagger and you see a picture of Rupert Murdoch, technically yeah. that's repetition. Yeah. <laughs> Rufus. <laughs> and um, I give way to you. Okay. Well done, Graham. Oh, you, okay. you, you have the subject still. An incorrect challenge. A point for that. And you have 12 seconds still. Optimism starting now. Each time I play this game, I am full of hope. Oh, I've said that before. Uh, that I might win. But of course, that is foolishness because I think I've won it once. Uh, oh. Paul, you've challenged. Was there a slight hesitation there? No. Oh, I. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to have him shout at me again. <laughs> He's bullied you into submission. <laughs> <laughs> so no incorrect challenge, Graham. Another point to you. And you have two seconds to go, starting now. Maybe this will be the week when I actually triumph and I... <laughs> so at the end of the first round, you won't be surprised to hear that Graham Norton has taken a strong lead. And Pam, would you begin the next round? Oh, something I close to your heart, I'm sure. The Great Outdoors. 60 seconds, starting now. I first learned to love the great outdoors as a young girl riding a borrowed pony through a local wood called Hatford Warren. Oh, it was so beautiful. And I used to ride along through the soft... Yes, Rufus, you challenge. Repetition of ride? Well done. She was oh. riding a Paul pony and she was riding along. Well listened, Rufus. Well. I, I, I uh, am new to this, but keen to learn. <laughs> You've been a fast learner. You've gone in very rapidly there with three regulars against you. 46 seconds are still available, Rupert. Uh, the great outdoors starting now. When you think of the world that is not in your house, the world you are thinking of... Yes. 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 Uh, 
Yes. Yes. I, I accuse him of saying world twice. <laughs> you were right, and it was so obvious I couldn't uh, twist it so that it keep a newcomer in. Because I have to tell our listeners, the first time Rufus has played the game, and it was obvious from the way he started then. And <laughs> You've already contributed oh, tremendously. No, it's lovely listen. to have right. But I have to give it to Pam on this occasion. <laughs> Pam, the great outdoors, and there are 39 seconds still available. They're starting now. Padded with generations of leaf fall and punctuated by fallen moss encrusted logs. What undiluted joy it was to urge the equine forward and soar blissfully over these natural obstacles as the wind murmured in the canopy above us. Rabbits darted into the undergrowth, their white skirts showing, and the fragrance of the disturbed earth was more heady than any Frenchified... Oh, I... Graham, you've challenged I think she's arousing the audience. <laughs> it's not radio at all. It's a bit racy on Gardener's Question Time. <laughs> Someone's hit the hard shoulder listening yeah, yeah. to this. <laughs> so we'll have you a challenge within the rules of just a minute, Graham? Well, just plain old deviation, I would say. From what? F from, well, just nice Radio 4 land. <laughs> She's taken us into some D.H. Lawrence bacchanal. <laughs> She painted a picture of the great outdoors to me. I did. And I was thinking of your blood pressure too, Nicholas. <laughs> Listen, no, I, I was out there with her on I the I know, moors. you were looking yeah. very flush. <laughs> you know, it was Listen, like... Uh, I was urging the equine forward. <laughs> <laughs> I was out in the great outdoors. You were so in the I great was describing she was the rabbits, there, And I was with her by her side. It was like Wuthering Heights all over again. Yeah. <laughs> I hotly resent the challenge, mister. <laughs> well, you don't need to, Pam, because I give you the uh, benefit of the doubt and say that you have another point and you have two seconds to continue, if you wish, on the great outdoors starting now. Than any brothel-like perfume. What halcyon <laughs> days they were. That was my buzz. It was an automatic system that kicked in. <laughs> So no, I was saying that the, the fragrance of the disturbed earth was more heady than any Frenchified, exotic, brothel-like perfume. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, I'm sorry, Rufus, I know you challenged no, no, again, but what was your challenge for? Oh, I've forgotten. I thought Have you I'm... got a challenge within the rules of just a minute? No, I haven't, no. Oh, oh well, well, you, well, then, Pam, you've got another point. Uh, <laughs> two seconds. The Great Outdoors, starting now. Boiling up the billy can and enjoying... <laughs> <laughs> so, Pam Ayers with entry to the whistle wind, and whoever is speaking in this game when the whistle goes gains an extra point. So, Pam Ayers is now equal with Graham Norton, the lead one ahead of Rufus Hound and Paul Merton, and... Uh, Rufus, it's with you to begin. The subject is humble pie. Can you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? So often in life, one chances your arm in making a statement or offering a joke which could fall foul of the listener. Under these conditions, an apology should be immediately proffered. If not, and yet later it is decided that you have transgressed in some way, you should be made to eat humble pie. It is a posh way of saying, say sorry, why don't you? And yet, at the same time, conveys, does it not, a... <laughs> <laughs> I love the way you laugh at your misdemeanours. Oh, right. It's because I can hear myself on the radio, sitting at home, listening to the radio, going, this bloke's rubbish at this. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a little while to get acclimatised, well, yeah. but you're doing well. It's much better than the first time you spoke. Yes. <laughs> a slow <laughs> improvement. <laughs> Pam, you challenge first. Yes, a repetition. No, hesitation. <coughs> and hesitation. there are 29 seconds available. Humble pie starting now. Humble pie is a disgusting concoction of liver, lights, heart, and all the offal that drops out of a carcass of an animal when it is opened up in the abattoir. Yuck! Oh. Uh, Graham challenge. What the hell has happened to Pam <laughs> Like, uh, I don't know, some sort of like medieval butcher. I mean, <laughs> rubbing herself like it's a horse. I, this isn't the woman I've met before. So, what is your challenge? What deviation from Pam Ayers? <laughs> well, all I can do, do then. Do you have ID on you, Pam? <laughs> All I can do then, because we enjoyed that interruption, we'll give you a bonus point for what you've just yes. said. But 
Uh, she wasn't deviating in any way from the subject of humble pie. So, Pam, another point to you. And 16 seconds available, starting now. Traditionally eaten by the peasantry and those who did not have two halfpennies to rub together. On the other hand, humble pie suggests being shamed. Um, and uh, <laughs> Paul, you challenged. Oh, that was hesitation. There was a definite hesitation there, Paul. So you have a point, and you have the subject, humble pie. And four seconds to go, starting now. Dear gardener's question time, my husband can't find my clematis. <laughs> so I was... <laughs> Speaking to whistle when gain that extra point, it's very, very close. Uh, who's challenged, Pam? Yes? I don't know what that had to do with humble pie. Very little. Well, <laughs> right. Uh, Graham, we're back with you to begin. The subject is famous last words. Tell us something about that subject in this game, if you can, starting now. Poor dying people. Not bad enough to be lying on your deathbed, taking your last breath, but there's the added pressure to come up with something profound or witty to sign off with. <laughs> and even if you do come up with something von Moe... Oh, Pam Challenge. I thought there was a repetition of come up with. And something yes, as well. Yes, yes. All right. Yes, like Well, roses. listen, Pam, and 44 seconds, famous last words with you starting now. George V is reputed to have said Burger Bogner as his last words, but I don't actually think they were. I think it was suggested to him. I, yeah, uh, I just said Rufus it Rufus It was a repetition of think, it but was, I only got was, there because you paused in the middle like, oh, well, that's me done then. <laughs> No, you're not done. Oh. You were in there with a point for a correct challenge, Rufus. And you've got the subject of famous last words starting now. I've just realised that I know absolutely nobody's famous last words, but instead now I find myself imagining, looking at this panel, what the famous last words of each member on it would be. For example, Pam might say something along the lines of what rhymes with car kit. But I like to think that maybe... <laughs> No. Pam, challenge. I object. That makes me sound like an idiot. <laughs> it would be a strange world where those words became famous. Yeah. <laughs> what rhymes with car kit? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of things. I think I've been giving bonus points. Graham's got one, Paul's got one. <laughs> Pam, you have one for an, an amusing interruption oh, then. Good. And you get a point for that. But you get a point because it's an incorrect challenge. Yes. And you have 15 seconds available for famous last words starting now. <laughs> what was the challenge? Hesitation. Yeah. It was hesitation. <laughs> uh, and you've only played the game. You haven't played the game once yet. No. So when I say start now... Yes. <laughs> I, I think that rule applies to everything, Nicholas, not just this game. <laughs> yes, it does, but we're not down to basics like that. I know. <laughs> Paul, it was a correct challenge, so we give you the point for that. But we leave it with Rufus, and uh, you've got um, 14 seconds still, Rufus. You okay. ready? Uh, no. 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 Could you Oops. give me 25 minutes and a writer? <laughs> this audience wouldn't. I could, but... Uh... I have a poppadom if you'll get a writer. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. 14 seconds, Rufus. Take a breath. Famous last words starting now. So my agent phones me and says, we would like to be the ones to tell you you've been invited to go on a world-famous radio show, a bastion of British broadcasting. Would you like to go on it? And I said, yes! <laughs> so, Rufus, you get a point for speaking as a whistle away and gain that extra point. And you're, you're in second place behind Pam Ayres. And you're ah. just one ahead of Graham Norton and Paul Merton. Paul, we're back with you to begin. Yes. The subject is a day at the races. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. Well, it's both a title of a Marx Brothers film made in 1938 and an LP by the rock group Queen, A Day at the Races. It's one of the more famous films that MGM made in the 1930s. Pam <laughs> Jones. I, I thought there was a repetition of film, but it might have been plural. It might have been film and film. No, it was MGM. Pardon? Repetition of M. <laughs> yes. I thought Good point, M Nicholas. <laughs> Pam, you have the subject. <laughs> <laughs> no, Paul, said... well, I have to let them know that I'm listening. Oh, well, I know and, you're listening. Uh, but, but, Pam, I can't give it to you, because it wasn't your challenge. 
So no, I thought I thought Paul started off by saying it's the name of a film and I something might have else. Done. But I think we we'll give the benefit of the doubt to Paul and say yep. forty-eight seconds still available, Paul. A day at the races starting now. So Clement Freud, who used to sit in the chair that Pam Ayres is now seated, he was a keen race goer and he would often spend a day at the races in those seats. Oh, I would have. <laughs> Pam, you see, you got in anyway. There we are. Well, I thought it was hesitation. You thought it. It was definitely hesitation. Yes, right. Okay. And Pam, you've got him with 37 seconds to go. A day at the races starting now. My favourite day at the races is Bybury Duck Race, which takes place on Boxing Day along the River Churn, where decoy birds are placed into the water with numbers on their backs. And you have to bet on them, and all the money goes to charity. And a man walks along in waders behind them, <laughs> shooing them along. And the first past the winning post is the winner, uh, as you might think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you challenged There was a bit of a hesitation. There so was a bit, yes. So, Paul, you've got in with ten seconds to go on a day at the races starting now. The King George IV chase has been run for 30 years, I thought to myself the other day. Haven't they caught him yet? He must be a busy man. <laughs> running down the track like this, keeping his crown on. Ha-ha, <laughs> suckers, you'll never get me. Oh... <laughs> I think we just before the whistle, Graham. It's what a repetition of ha? Yes. Ha. Ah. No, it was. It was. No, and I feel awful. Yes, yes, it was. <laughs> yes. I had no idea that it was going to kind of hit the bell so close. It's terrible. Yes. Well, that's that's the game, isn't it? In fairness, and, it is. And yes. <laughs> and you cleverly got in with half a second to go. Yes. <laughs> a day at the races starting now. A day at the races at that. Yay! Right, it's neck and neck of your interest in the scores. Only one point separates all four of them. And Pam, we're back with you to begin. And the subject is William Shakespeare. Tell us something about that erudite subject in this game, starting now. I was once called upon to perform a tract from The Taming of the Shrew, and I assumed my most dramatic expression of entreaty, walked out and began, fie, twice, unknit that unkind, wrinkled brow, and dart not scornful glances from those eyes, to wound thy lord and king, your master, he who cares for thee. Whereupon, seeing the adjudicator in the audience, I observed that her face had frozen into an expression of shock and disbelief at my interpretation of the deathless words of the bard. Um, um. <laughs> uh, a justified round of applause. And Paul, you've got in... Hesitation. Yeah, hesitation, right. Uh, uh, William Shakespeare's with you, Paul, now. 18 seconds starting now. Glamorous thou art and cordor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not. Oh. Well, that was, that was Shakespeare. That was Shakespeare. Then. Repetition of thou. Blame Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> Shakespeare's. I'm, 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 yeah, that's true, <laughs> was it? <laughs> Graham, you again got in very close to the whistle. There's what? still five seconds available. Oh, five seconds in space. <laughs> This will stretch you. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> You'll have to say his name three times. Yeah. <laughs> Five seconds, Graham. William Shakespeare, starting now. William Shakespeare lived in a place called Stratford upon Avon, I believe, and was married to the Oscar winner. Mm. So Graham Norton was then speaking because the whistle went. Oh, Graham is now equal in the lead with Pam Ayres, and one point behind is Paul Merton, and then two points behind is Rufus Hound. And Rufus, we're back with you to begin. I don't know why you've got the subject. Maybe you know about it, maybe not, but otherwise, try and talk on the subject of the Isle of Man. 60 seconds. <laughs> There's nothing funny about that. <laughs> but I'm glad you laugh, because we, we play for every little chuckle we can get. <laughs> Rufus, the Isle of Man's with you, starting now. They say no man is an island except when he's in the bath. The Isle of Man <laughs> is not a man who is an isle. He is instead <laughs> a place where off the coast... <laughs> it's like a dog limping down the road. <laughs> uh, well done, Rufus. I didn't understand any of it, no, but it was lovely. Yeah, no. yeah. What is your challenge, Paul? Pity. <laughs> We've all been around an Isle of Man thing. Well, no, no, I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm wrong, actually. I don't have a challenge. Well, you, oh, you, you do. 
You can have it back if you want it back. Uh, oh, you're Let very generous. Go on, give me one more. Give, give, me, go, give yeah, me a go. Yeah, go, yeah, 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 exactly. Right, yeah, Let yeah. Me limber up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> very generous, Paul, because uh, he was Don't be so bit. surprised by what you're saying. Mm. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. Just talking comes naturally to me. But the moment Nicholas Barson says now, yeah. every thought in my brain <laughs> disappears out of my bum hole. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are still 48 seconds, Rufus. OK. <laughs> Paul <laughs> has given it back to you. I will grind every one of these out. Yeah. <laughs> 12, Take a seconds, deep 12 seconds are gone. Look at it that way. 12 seconds are finished. Yeah. Mm. You're never getting them back. Yeah. <laughs> The I'm last time somebody said that to me, I just lost my virginity. <laughs> what goes on before the show should be <laughs> said. <laughs> Right. I'm in, I'm in. So, Rufus, you have another point, of course. <laughs> yeah. Incorrect order for generosity, Paul. Yeah. Uh, 48 seconds available, starting now. I have no idea where the Isle of Man is. The only thing I know about the Isle of Man is that the Isle of Man has the TT races. Um... <laughs> Honestly, I, I would say it's a repetition of T, but, but, but also you can slow right down. <laughs> you don't have to talk as fast as you're talking. <laughs> Which, ironically, you then said TT races, but uh, I, I'll you, let you have the subject again. A third go, another go. <laughs> another go. What do you think, Nick? Do you agree? Yeah. The, the fair thing is to give Paul a point for a correct challenge, because he did say TT, but he's very generously given it back to you. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, it's, it's a good way of winning points. It's just... <laughs> With 42 yeah. seconds also, to go. I'm not sure anyone wants the subject no. to be... <laughs> oh, I don't know. I could talk about the Isle of Man quite happily. I'm sure happily, you could. Yes. <laughs> I've been there. My association is uh -oh, Kippers. Oh, now he is. <laughs> you, 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 you knew it before it was an island, when it was still attached to the mainland. <laughs> Why do you clap his insults? <laughs> Shall I tell you what happened? I was doing a show over there and I rushed to catch the plane back and I bought some of these wonderful kippers which they cook on the beach and took them in my bag. I got on the aeroplane and the whole of the plane stank of <laughs> kippers. I just kept still pretending it wasn't me. Perhaps you said to the pilot afterwards, I apologise for the smell and he said, thank you for apologising. If you hadn't said anything, I'd have sworn it was the kippers. <laughs> I don't know if you were clapping Paul and my reaction. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> uh, Rufus, he's giving it back to you. There Hooray! are 42, 42 <laughs> seconds available. Your favourite subject, the Isle of Man, starting now. The Isle of Man does remind me of a very funny story that was told to me not so long ago. A friend of mine had been on the Isle of Man and bought some smoked fish. And he was getting on the aeroplane. And the smell of these kippers was overpowering. The other passengers were very upset about it. Indeed, he feared that the pilot might also be rather concerned. And as he disembarked, he turned to him, twinkling in his <laughs> eyes, and said, I do apologise for the smell. And the man who had flown the aeroplane replied, Well, thank you for uh, saying you're sorry. I thought it was the swimming items that <laughs> had been processed in salt. <laughs> so, Rufus, you get a point for speaking as a whistle away and gain that extra point. Rufus, you're in second place. The other three are equal in the lead, but only one point ahead of you. So, for a first time player of the game, you are doing magnificently. Thank you very much. And this is the last round, I've been told. Oh, oh let me give you. <laughs> Right, let me give you the situation. Well, I actually indicated what it might be. Rufus Hound has never played the game before. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's doing... Don't laugh, you're doing... No, 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 I just don't think anybody listening doubts that. <laughs> you are only one point behind the other three players, Paul, Pam and Graham, who are equal in the lead, ahead of you by one point. So it's all to play for if you're interested in the points. And Graham, we're back with you to begin. The subject now is Catch 22. Tell us something about that phrase in this game starting now. Catch 22 is a book and a film. The pages bit was written by Joseph Heller, I believe. The film. Oh, I've said that twice. Yeah. <laughs> Pam, you challenge first. Uh, a repetition of film. Yeah, yes, the film. Pam, yes, Pam. Right. So. <laughs> 
There are 51 seconds available. Catch 22, Pam, starting now. I was walking along the banks of the Thames beside Tadpole Bridge, a famous and venerable old structure, and I met a man who had been fishing. How did you get on, I said. He said, I caught 21, and I said, oh. <laughs> I looked at you, Pam, and I waited for the payoff, and you suddenly dried. Oh, right. Can so, you Paul, guess you came what in the first. the next line might have been. <laughs> I dried, I'm afraid. Oh, you did dry. Anyway, it was a yeah. hesitation. Paul, you have another point. 31 seconds available. Catch 22, we're starting now. The film was made around about 1970, directed by Mike Nichols, and Orson Welles played a very large part within the movie. It was a magnificent book written by Joseph Heller at the beginning of the 1960s, and initially it was called Catch 18, but there was another book with a similar title with that number in it. So, at the very last minute it was changed to catch 22 which somehow is much catchier if you excuse the pun that's not really one of those because it's virtually the same word i was reading this book when i was about oh <laughs> graham challenge Reputation a book yes yes yeah, the book i was trying to avoid repeating film <laughs> <laughs> you've done that to you graham and you have got in with two seconds oh, to go no. <laughs> it's like i'm doing an impression of someone who's good at this game <laughs> Anyway, sorry. No, no. I'm yeah. sorry. Well, that's the game. Yeah, Part yeah. of the fun, isn't it? Part of the tension. Absolutely. And two seconds to go, Graham. Catch 22, starting now. It takes a very smart man to be the president. So, Graham Norton, as I'm speaking, as a whistle went, and Rufus, who's never played the game before, but he did very well. He was a, a very commanding fourth place. And, <laughs> No, but he was only two points behind Pam Ayers and Paul Merton, equal in second place, but one point ahead. So we say you are the winner this week. That is Graham Norton. <laughs> we do hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute, and it only remains for me to say thank you to these four fine and humorous players of the game, Paul Merton, Pam Ayers, Graham Norton, and Rufus Hound. I thank Hayley Sterling, who's helped me with the score, blown her whistle with such style when the 60 seconds elapsed. We thank our producer, Victoria Lloyd. We're indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this amazing game. And we're very grateful to this lovely, exciting-looking audience here, who've cheered us on a way magnificent. <laughs> They've been part of the show. So from our lovely audience and from me, Nicholas Parsons, and the team, goodbye, thank you, and tune in again the same time when we play Just a Minute! Yes! <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute! is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it's my huge pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country, but around the world, but also to welcome to the programme for exciting personalities, who this week are going to show their skill with words and language as they speak on a subject that I give them, and they try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. And they are, seated on my right, Paul Merton and Tim Rice, and seated on my left, Giles Brandreth and Esther Ransom. Will you please welcome all four of them. <laughs> Beside me sits Hayley Sterling. She's going to help me keep the score and she will blow a whistle when the 60 seconds have elapsed. And we begin the show with Paul Merton. Oh, Paul, a lovely subject. I mean, I adore bubble and squeak. <laughs> Tell us something about Bubble and Squeak in this game, Paul, starting now. Well, Bubble and Squeak is a name given to a dish which essentially is fried made-overs from the previous meal. You have a bit of cabbage, potato, some sources say that carrot is allowed. World War II was a popular time for having this kind of thing when rationing was very much prevalent in the day. Nicholas Parsons, the finest pilot the Luftwaffe had ever had, <laughs> was one day saying to himself, I would like to have some bubble and squeak. I realised what I said, that he was actually an undercover agent. He wasn't really a Nazi, but he was <laughs> in the sky. Uh, Tim, you challenged. I thought there was a hesitation there. Oh, yes, there was, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Only because he was being rude to me again, I imagine. Yeah. Right, Tim, 
I agree. You have a point for a correct challenge. You take over the subject. And there are 29 seconds still available. Bubble and squeak starting now. My brother Andy, when he was only six, had two rabbits of which he was very fond. One was named Bubble and the other was called Squeak. Now, the interesting thing about this kind of animal is that whenever... Giles. Repetition of animal. No, he said two animals. Oh, two, two. I mean, I meant the word did two. Did you say he had... Two. Repetition of two. <laughs> challenge after yeah, three. it's very dodgy, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, he didn't say animals, he said animals. Yeah. I said, I said yes. rabbits two, first time. Yeah. Rabbits. Rabbits. So he didn't repeat the word animals. I was just trying to keep you on your toes, Nicholas. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, an, an incorrect challenge, Jim. Have another point. You have the subject. 17 seconds still available. Bubble and squeak starting now. These <laughs> animals were... Oh, <laughs> I seem to have the gift of foresight. <laughs> Repetition of animals. <laughs> Well done, Giles. <laughs> you created that for yourself. Mm. Well done. 15 seconds are still available. You have a point. You have Bumble and Squeak starting now. Nicholas, did you ever have pet names for your private parts? Along the lines of... <laughs> Can I... <laughs> oh, Lord, I Can think I... the answer to that question is certainly not. <laughs> For decency, human decency. Excuse me, you accused him of being possibly a Nazi, certainly a member of the Luftwaffe. <laughs> All I'm saying is he called his private parts Bubble and Squeak. I didn't have a pet name for my private parts. Uh, I remember our parents, it was a very ordered time in which we grew up, we used to call them Rudis. Uh, a very strange word for them. I, I wish I hadn't said that now, because it didn't. <laughs> Thank you, the audience, right. So it turns out that you did have a pet name for your private part, Rudy's, and therefore the yes. challenge has to be invalid. Yes. Who challenged? Well, I... <laughs> Without a sense of moral duty, I challenge. But, um, I don't have a challenge under the rules of just a minute, so I'm quite happy for... Uh... I'm rather shocked by this whole story because I didn't realise that Nicholas had a German past, but the fact that he called his private parts Rudy obviously means that he had. <laughs> Very good. Very good. The best thing I suggest is we start the programme again. <laughs> yeah. Hermann, Rudy and Adolf were his three favourite That's so. Right. So, um, uh, Giles, incorrect challenge. And so you have a point. Ten seconds still available. Bubble and Squeak starting now. Bubble and Squeak was one of the great Victorian vaudeville acts. They appeared along with Dan Lino, Herbert Campbell, in the Arthur Collins Company in 1858. And remarkably, <laughs> what... A poor challenge. That's a bit early, 1858 You're, 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 you're absolutely right. You're yeah, absolutely yeah. right. <laughs> He's completely correct. Arthur Collins didn't take over at Drury Lane until 1892. I bow to his <laughs> So your knowledge of show business, Paul, helps you again. And you have a correct challenge. And you have half a second to go. <laughs> Bubble and squeak, starting now. You can squeak my... <laughs> Whoever is speaking this game, when the whistle goes, gains an extra point. It was Paul Merton. And at the end of that round, they all have two points. Esther hasn't got any yet, but she has contributed very well. And, uh, <laughs> Tim, we're with you to begin the next round. Alipia, will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? As everybody knows, the Earth takes 365 days to go once around the sun. Esther, you remember? 365 and a quarter days. Well, I was coming on to this. But you hadn't, you hadn't yet come on to it. True, but... <laughs> I'd only been going for nine seconds. Do you get minus points for pedantry? <laughs> no. You could do, but I won't do it on this again. No, no. I, I don't think it's necessary, Esther, but um, well tried. Um... <laughs> Have fun! Uh, a point to you, Tim. 53 seconds still available. Alipia starting now. However, every so often, round this. <laughs> Paul, Paul Challenge. Oh, repetition of round. round yes, the sun. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so, um, Paul, you've gone in there. Thrown. With 49 seconds to go, the subject is Alipia starting now. I left the civil service on February the 29th, 1980, which, if you go by leap years, is only nine years ago. But I suppose what I <laughs> think... Esther Challenge. Did he say nine year ago? Yes, yeah. because he, he didn't want to say years. He'd already used the word years. Yeah. <laughs> so is it a deviation from sense? No, it doesn't really matter in this game. <laughs> Paul, an incorrect challenge. 40 seconds are still available. A leap year starting now. That was a long time ago indeed. Tim Challenge. Repetition of a go? 
Yes. Mm. You did say a go before. Yeah, yeah possibly. Yeah. Yes, right. <laughs> so, Tim, you have another point. You have the subject. 37 seconds still available. A leap year starting now. I would like to go on a completely different tack for several reasons. Well, Paul Challenge. Deviation. <laughs> By definition, a completely different tack. Uh, I know. I think what I have to do there, Paul, is say it was a devious thought. But he wasn't actually... I was going to come back to a yes. whole new approach yes. to the leap year challenge. Oh, I, okay. I think he's entitled to that one. So an incorrect <laughs> challenge. Tim, another point. Yeah. Uh, 50, 33 seconds available. A leap year starting now. The high jump was completely revolutionised by Dick Fosbury in 1968 when he invented a jump named after his... Giles challenge. Repetition of jump. Yes. Well, it was high jump. Before the high jump. When he, re when he invented yes, the high jump. jump and jump are two that, different words. No, high jump is two words, and jump is a repetition <laughs> of... <laughs> He's played the game a few times before, Tim. <laughs> a point to uh, Giles, and uh, 25 seconds, Giles, a leap year starting now. One of the extraordinary things about the Soviet Empire is that in the USSR, in the year 1930... Oh, yes, Paul, you saw Oh, it double yes. S. Yes, repetition of S. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Two initials our chairman is more than familiar with. No, you're right. I think the SS is becoming something of a theme. <laughs> I have no German connections. <laughs> the SS, I have nothing to do with those people. Uh, we were just con <laughs> confused by the uniform you're wearing. <laughs> Paul, well, listen, the correct challenge. Uh, 19 seconds, a leap year starting now. I remember very clearly the leap year in question, February, March... Uh, oh, I mentioned February before. Sure, yes. Yes. Exactly, February. February. That's right, February, March again. And you're back with you, the leap year, uh, Giles, 14 seconds available, starting now. It is also known as a bisextile year, which is one of the reasons that transgender people use the opportunity of the 29th of February to make their leap into a new and exciting world. It's a remarkable nomenclature, and one that has given <laughs> encouragement... <laughs> so Giles, at least speaking when the whistle went. And it's even Stevens there, Paul, Tim and Giles are all equal in the lead. And Esther, we're with you to begin the subject, the Doomsday Book. Tell us something about that popular subject in this game, starting now. I always thought the doom in Doomsday meant fate or destiny, but it turns out it means judgment, because the Doomsday Book was assessed by Saxons on their tax liability in order to pay the Normans every possible groat or farthing they owned. This, I think, has an inspiration for these days inland revenue officials, because if they were to arrive at one's doorstep, on the back of a mule or an ass or a donkey, dressed in homespun robes with a rucksack on their back <laughs> containing a quill and perhaps some old-fashioned ink in order to create a book in wonderful calligraphy entirely written in Latin, maybe none of the panels would act a panelist. <laughs> well done, Esther. I believe all that concentration led me nowhere. <laughs> That's the RNA of this game. You did went so well. You work me. like mad and then someone leaps in and yes. grabs it from you. Oh. A um, bit like tax. Can really. I say, Esther, that's life. <laughs> You went for 48 seconds. Well oh, done. I can't believe yeah. it. Yes. So near and yet so far. Uh, but that's, that's just a minute. It's part of the fun of the show, my love. Of course, of course, of and course. I'm not Paul, you challenge first. Yeah, hesitation. You? Yes. 12 seconds are still available on the Doomsday Book, Paul, starting now. The book lay in the corner of the room, its cover extremely dusty. I knew I'd been the last person in that vicinity within the past 24 hours. Uh, Giles Chan. Repetition of past. Last and past. Last person. It was a blast from the last past. <laughs> I felt I heard past twice, but... No, he was last. The way he asserts it, you believe him, because no. he said it. <laughs> but it's possible you're right. No, I laugh. <laughs> uh, because it's so difficult sometimes to pick up these quick things, I'll have to ask you to be honest. Paul, did you say past? I thought I said past and last. I, I expect I you I thought did. you did as well. The Doomsday Book, Paul, starting now. The Doomsday Book weighed much heavier than I... <laughs> Paul Merton was speaking of the whistle again, the next point, and Giles were with you to begin, and the subject is, 
a mission to Mars. Tell us something about that in this game starting now. It was when I realised that a planet had been named after a chocolate bar that I came to the conclusion that this was to be the subject of my next musical. I called Tim Rice to ask him if he wanted to cooperate. He said, do you write music? I said, no. He said, I do the words. And so I am doing this all on my tot. It's most amusing. I appear as a kind of Dan Dare figure, leaping about. Act one, we are in the spaceship. It's an intergalactic rock opera. And Colonel Tim, as he's called. <coughs> Tim Challenge. Repetition of Tim. Yes. Yes. Oh. Well, listen, Tim, you yes. wouldn't, you wouldn't miss that Always hear one. your own name across a crowded room, don't yeah. you? <laughs> Tim, the correct challenge, a point to you. Uh, 28 seconds still available. A mission to Mars starting now. Mars is a very interesting place. It is a ball, a sphere of 4,225 miles in diameter. Around it move two small, extremely tiny, diminutive moons named Phobos and Deimos. These tiny objects sap through the Martian sky at the speed of a tortoise. A space tortoise, not... A... Oh. oh, you slipped yourself up then. I was going And so you only well. had two seconds to go. Oh. Oh. So a space Paul, you tortoise is one first. word, yes, surely. I I improbable, improbable repetition of tortoise on a mission of Mars as a subject. Yeah. <laughs> so, Paul, a correct chance. A mission to Mars, two seconds, starting now. I decided to send my tortoise all the way to Mars, and when he... <laughs> So with another point with uh, Paul, he's now taken a, a strong lead ahead of Tim Rice and Giles Brandreth in that order, and then Esther and Paul. We're back with you to begin. The subject is the Great Barrier Reef. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. Well, the Great Barrier Reef is one of those objects that you can see from outer space. Mind you, you have to be looking in the right direction. There's no good pointing towards Uranus. You won't see any starfish at all. <laughs> Whereas, if you're looking down at the planet, you can say to yourself, look at that magnificent... Uh, Tim Challenge. Repetition of look? Yes, mm, absolutely. Yes, yes. Tim, you've got him. <laughs> 45 seconds to go. The Great Barrier Reef. Starting now. The Great Barrier Reef is a long, thin thing which can be seen from space, as the genius on my right has already pointed out, but I would like to emphasise this because I haven't said it before. <laughs> and above all, the interesting thing of the Barrier Reef is that it is a living object. Comprise... <laughs> John, John, John. Hesitation. I was I'm taking a breath. So, yes. <laughs> Great challenge. It was uh, too long a breath. I'm afraid. <laughs> and there are 24 seconds still available, Giles. The Great Barrier Reef starting now. The Great Barrier Reef is the title of the musical that I am now writing <laughs> with Sir Tim Rice, starring Tom Jones and Tammy Grimes. It is going to be a huge success about a girl called Coral who has a bit of rough called Reef, and together they explore what life is like. Oh, Esther, you were so quick. <laughs> you pressed your buzzer. Yes, what's your challenge? Deviation from the truth. I can't believe a word of what you're saying. Exactly what I was going to suggest, yes. <laughs> Esther, don't you ever you have dreams? Don't you have dreams? I thought that was the You didn't establish, Giles, that it was a dream. You, you made it out as a fact. Well, because, of course, for me, life... <laughs> the fact of life is a dream. That I could be here with you... You are a great arguer, because... but you're failing dismally now. <laughs> OK. Well, listen, Esther. Well, thank you, listen. thank you. I mean, please, preposterous. Can you just reassure me, how many seconds have You've I got? You've only got three seconds. Oh! oh right. Right, you can do this, Esther, you the, can do the this. The Great you can Barrier do this. Reef, Esther, three seconds starting now. The Great Barrier Reef is somewhere off Australia and I've actually been there, but it was a waste of time! So Esther Manson, the speaker of the whistle when gained that extra point and she has leapt forward. She's still in fourth place, but she has... <laughs> And out in the lead is Paul Merton and Tim. We're back with you to begin. The subject, oh, an intellectual one here, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Tell us something about that amazing man in this game, starting now. When Isambard Kingdom Brunel was born, his parents had not decided upon those exotic names. They played around with the idea of Kevin or Phil. 
but in the end changed and settled for Isambard, a very distinguished starter for his moniker. His middle <laughs> name had to be something... <laughs> Was there was hesitation there. I'm afraid there was, yeah. It was so clever and interesting that um, you tripped yourself up, Well, if up, you I give think. it back to me, I'll continue. Yes. <laughs> well, I was being sarcastic, actually. <laughs> Giles, you... That's nice, isn't it? That's yes. nice. <laughs> Giles, the correct challenge. 41 seconds still available. Isambard Kingdom Brunel, starting now. Our musical about Isambard Kingdom <laughs> Brunel ran aground because we couldn't make Brunel rhyme with funnel. So we changed the name of the show to Isambard Kingdom Brunel, which didn't bring the punters in. Though I was very fond of the song that begins, This is the Great Britain and I am much smitten. There was also a fun song about bridge... Uh, Tim Challenge. I think he repeated song. Songs and songs. Yeah. And while I'm at it, songs there wasn't and enough songs. Tim in it. <laughs> I think there was songs and songs. Oh, OK. So, uh, 18 seconds, incorrect challenge. <laughs> 18 seconds uh, for you, uh, Giles, still on Isambard, Kingdom Brunel, starting now. There's a big chorus number that ends Brunel I.K. And all the girls... Uh, uh, Esther, challenge. I don't believe any of this. No. <laughs> I think it's a, a, a very blatant deviation from the truth. I explained it ran aground. I'm just giving you what I, how I tried to pitch it to Tim when we had the meeting. All right. Uh, he stayed for the whole... Uh, Elton left for some reason. <laughs> Giles, I gave it against you before because I thought it was a fiction, that other musical you were writing, and I agree now with Esther. It's another fiction that you are creating, and therefore it is, is deviation. Is fiction not fact. allowed, then, on the programme? You are allowed fiction, but... but we uh, others are allowed fiction, but not me, I see. No, you were... <laughs> You were laying it down as a fact that you had written this musical. No, no, I was presenting my fiction so convincingly <laughs> that Esther mistook it for fact. She showed us, do you remember all those vegetables, obscene vegetables she showed us? <laughs> and we believed that they were real. They'd been made in the props department back at Wood Lane, I know that. No, Esther, um, okay. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and say yes, correct challenge. 13 seconds, you tell us something about Isambard Kingdom Brunel starting now. I did worry about the parents who would push upon their poor baby these enormous names which would have hung like millstones around his neck until my own first grandson was born and to my absolute astonishment... <laughs> wow. So Esther Mantram was then speaking as a whistle when gained an extra point and she is moving forward. And uh, Esther, it's your turn to begin. The subject now, the green-eyed monster. Tell us something about that subject in this game starting now. The green-eyed monster is, of course, that terrible vice and sin, jealousy. And for me, it's encapsulated in Shakespeare's great tragedy, Othello, because there was the mighty hero, the warrior, the soldier, who enchanted his beautiful bride with stories of his heroic achievements. And all would have ended very well apart from Iago, the villain who smiled and who engendered in the aforementioned uh, gender. Tim, you challenged. I'm sorry to be a cad, but it was, it was slowly falling apart. Yeah. I'm afraid. Well, I don't think it was slowly falling apart. I was getting well, lost quickly in... falling apart, then. I was getting lost in the tragedy. I was getting to the good bit. Oh, were you? Yes. <laughs> hang about. Hang about, Paul. But, uh, uh, but Tim's got him with the correct challenge. Another point to him. 31 seconds still available, Tim. The green-eyed monster starting now. The green-eyed monster, along with many other prehistoric animals, was wiped out by a meteorite 65 million years ago when this object... <coughs> Giles Challenge. Fiction. <laughs> right, if I'm going to give it against you on your fantasy about these musicals you haven't written, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt on this one to say another sort of fiction there, and 21 seconds are still available, Giles, for <laughs> the green-eyed monster starting now. May I give you, as a matter of fact, the story that in 1974 I had the idea of making a musical out of a fellow <laughs> and discovered that Jack Good had already had a comparable notion, creating a show called Catch My Soul, based on the story of the Moor of Venice from which play, of course, the phrase, the green-eyed monster comes. Earlier... 
So, Giles, I hope you feel that was justice, because you went, kept going, and got that extra point for speaking as the whistle went. And you're now equal in the lead with Paul Merton, followed by Tim Rice and Esther Ransom in that order. And, Giles, we're with you to begin. And the subject is Kiwis. Kiwis. Kiwis, tell, tell me about Kiwis starting now. Kiwis are fruits, and I was going to do a children's show all about a salad of such things in which the kiwi would have been central, falling in love with the banana but having a little relationship on the side with the tangerine, <laughs> mistaking it for an orange, all juiced up in an amusing way. Kiwis also are a nickname for people from New Zealand where the flightless bird, the kiwi, comes. Kiwi! Uh, Paul Janet. A repetition of kiwi. Oh, yes, well done. Oh, it's Kiwis. Ki kiwis yes. is on the card. How, how can you get Kiwis without repeating Kiwi? <laughs> you have to try and do it in just a minute. <laughs> so, well, listen, Paul, you played the game a few times before. You've got in with 33 seconds to go on Kiwis starting now. It's a shame these birds are killed so people can simply shine their shoes. I <laughs> ask you to sign a petition now in the high street. The Kiwi is a much protected bird. Kiwis are beautiful. Their plumage is superb. As you see a flock of them flying across... Uh, Jim Challenge. They can't fly. I know. <laughs> I think you're right. Oh, I'm thinking of planes. <laughs> Planes. Flightless birds. Tim, a correct challenge. No, no, no. 16 seconds are still away available. <laughs> Kiwis starting now. New Zealanders are a wonderful people and they are known affectionately as Kiwis. They are very great rivals with the people across the Tasman Sea. Giles challenge. Repetition of people. Lovely people. They and are rivals of the people, people across the Right on. Right on. Well, yeah. So, Giles, you've got him with five seconds to ah, go. Yes. On Kiwis starting now. Kiwis is a French question that you ask when your little child is going to do pee. <laughs> so let me give you the score now, because we're moving into the final round. Oh. <laughs> and it's very interesting, because Giles has now taken the lead, one ahead of Paul Merton, oh. and he's three ahead of um, Tim Rice, and they're all a few points ahead of Esther Ransom. <laughs> No, no, Esther's never played the game before. And they are three experienced players who give no quarter at all. And whose turn is begin? Paul, we're back with you to start. And the subject is channel hopping. Tell us something about channel that. Channel hopping. Channel hopping, yes. Tell us something about that in this game, starting now. Perhaps one of the worst inventions ever was the remote control, because it meant you could then change the channels on your television without getting out of your preferred seating position. Therefore, the whole entertainment world was opened up where thousands of TV... Uh, Tim Challenge? I'm afraid, by your high standards, Paul, mm. you hesitated. <laughs> I wouldn't have bleeped anybody else, but you're so good, you actually <laughs> just hesitated well, enough. Thank you for that marvellous compliment. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't get you any extra points, but it's a correct challenge. Right. So you have another point, and you have 45 seconds, uh, Tim. Channel hopping starting now. I agree with Mr Merton about this remote control thing. It's a real drag. If you want to change from channel... Oh, Esther, yes. Was that a hesitation about change? Did you, did you have problems saying... Is it... Oh, thank you. <laughs> By Thank his you. normally high standards, I would say. <laughs> I think whatever your challenge, the audience would have agreed with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you've got a point, Esther, you've got the subject. You have 37 seconds. Tell us something about channel hopping starting now. I'm absolutely astonished that the gentleman on this panel should criticise the remote control, since it's quite clear that only people of their gender actually have the right to control the <laughs> damn... Oh, There's two controls. Giles. Repetition of control. Oh, uh, correct. Challenge, Giles. And you have 26 seconds. Tell us more about channel hopping starting now. Fortunately, I have seven grandchildren, which means I am able to use the zapper in our house. We have succeeded in getting the subtitles up, not off the screen, and when they come to visit us, we are able to channel hop, which I love to do because I've discovered extraordinary things going on in the television world that I had no idea when we only had BBC One. Oh. 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 How can I have made such an elementary blunder? Oh. After you've played the game a lot, you don't usually make those blunders, but you, you can't help it. He so, is, Paul, I know what the challenge is. One. Repetition of B. B, yeah. yes. <laughs> and you've got him with two seconds to go. Oh. 
That's so disappointed, isn't it? <laughs> but well deserved, because you listen well. Two seconds, Paul. Channel hopping starting now. From Lid Airport over to La Touque. <laughs> So, Paul Martin, speaking of the whistle, when gain that extra point, I give you the final score. It actually makes it very fair, because Esther, who hasn't played the game before, um, did very well and came in a magnificent fourth place. <laughs> she was a few points behind Tim Rice, who was in second place. No, actually, Esther was in third place, because Tim was in second place. But equal in the lead were Paul Merton and Giles Brown. Very fair, equal winners. <laughs> It only remains for me to say thank you to these four fine players of the game, Paul Merton, Tim Rice, Giles Brandreth and Esther Ransom. I thank Hayley Sterling, who's helped me with the score, blown her whistle with such style when the 60 seconds elapsed. We thank our producer, Victoria Lloyd. We're indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this amazing game. And to our listeners, from me, Nicholas Parsons, what I say is, tune in again the same time when we play Just a Minute! <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello. Hello. My name is Nicholas Parsons. And as the minute walls fades away, once more it's my huge pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country, but around the world. And also to welcome to the programme four dynamic, exceptional personalities who are going to speak in this subject, and they'll try and do that without hesitation, repetition or deviation. And those four are, seated on my right, Stephen Fry and Josie Lawrence, and seated on my left, Jenny Eclair and Nish Kumar. Will you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> Beside me sits Hayley Sterling, who's going to run the stopwatch and keep the score, and blow the whistle when the 60 seconds have elapsed. And we're going to begin the show with Stephen Fry. Oh, Stephen, a cat nap. Can you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? Well, at my age, you start to rely on cat naps every single day. They're a necessity to get you through the 24-hour period. I to remember cat napping was an episode of one of my very favorite cultural events which was tom and jerry 1951 fred quimby the great producer hannah and barbara joseph and william of that name who wrote it and uh, provided the story marvelous talents in animation it was a terrific thing he was on a hammock the cat thomas and he was ah yes Jenny's no, cat is fine. No. God, he's clever. <laughs> oh, he's fiendish. You see what he's done? He's tricked me. Because yes. cat, but cat is in the title. Yeah. Yeah. And also he was very clever because he changed it from Tom to Thomas. <laughs> um, yes. So an incorrect challenge. So, Stephen, you have your first point and you keep the subject. There are 29 seconds still available starting now. We had a Siamese called Jemina, not a name I've ever heard of in any other context, and some brigands, villains, thieves stole her. She was catnapped. It was the most... Terrible thing. <laughs> a ransom was demanded of us. We weren't sure what to do. Do we call the police? Maybe. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, do do's. Yes. Yeah. Do do's, yes. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. They were next to each other, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't yeah, do it to anybody close, but they were repetition. normally. So, Janie, a yeah. correct challenge. <laughs> and you've got the subject, of course. And you have 11 seconds. A cat nap starting now. There is nothing I like more than to curl up on the windowsill or sofa in a warm spot, feeling the sun warming the hairs oh. on oh. my oh. back. No, 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 no. <laughs> I just think, hang on, a windowsill. <laughs> Jenny. Um, Jenny, with all due respect to your comely frame, you couldn't fit on a windowsill. <laughs> oh, Nicholas! No, I've he's seen gorgeous. Gorgeous. I mean, but, 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 Jenny, you don't. Actually, actually, Stephen Josie's light came on, yes. so she challenged first. What was yes, your challenge? Yes, I know, I, and I made a mistake. I thought warm and warming, but I have mm -hmm. seen pictures of Jenny's house, and she doesn't have windowsills. No, no. But uh, also, <laughs> yes, she, I thought she got it for warm, and she said warming. Yes, so it was did. an incorrect challenge, so I can't accept that. <laughs> and Jenny got a point for an incorrect <laughs> challenge. And, <laughs> You still got the subject, catnap, and you've only got two seconds, starting yeah. now. Woe betide me, though, if I try. Yeah. <laughs> 
in this game, whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point. It was, of course, Jenny Clare, and she's got the lead at the end of the round. And Josie Lawrence, would you begin the next mm. round? Oh, Easter Bunny. <laughs> We've got a lot of animals here, but um, would you tell us something about that in this game starting now? Well, I've got a mate called Gerald who's an actor, but he also is a children's entertainer. <laughs> and he dresses up as an Easter bunny around Easter and does gigs. The night before one of these shows, he put his Easter bunny outfit into the machine. When it came out of the wash, the stiffener on the ears had flopped. <laughs> he didn't know what to do, so he got a wire. Stephen Challenge. Well, there's two gots. I got a friend. I oh, it's things. true. Got, yeah, yeah. Sorry, oh, please. I hope I get it back because it's oh. such a good oh, story. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, oh. Don't worry, Josie, you can finish it off the oh. end of the round. Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you in the green room, <laughs> yeah. Stephen. Oh, oh, but Stephen, sorry. a great challenge. I feel I'll crow. tell you in the green room. Right. Yeah. No, you'll tell us all at the end <laughs> of this round. Uh, there, there, was, there was too much got there. Um, 34 seconds for you, Stephen, if you wanted, on uh, the Easter Bunny starting now. I believe the myth of the Easter Bunny comes from Germanic lands, der Osterhase, which means the Easter hare, as a matter of fact. Oster meaning Easter. Ah. No, it's Jersey. one word, Osterhase. I'm very sorry to have to tell you. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell Josie, because she challenged you. Oh, him. you're so good. Oh, that's yeah. it. No, it is one way. It's, it's, oh, yeah, I feel sorry. like such a dumb cough. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dan, you're not a dumb cough, you know. He does this to trip up the opponents here. The last time I played with Stephen, he managed to persuade all of us on the panel <laughs> that a word that he made up <laughs> was real. I know. And I was going, I don't think that's a However, word. However, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, was it per chap, yeah. per something? However, I think it was. With However. An M in it. However, <laughs> with an M in it. And it was <laughs> one occasion. And in the end, Nicholas, we were going, yes, Stephen, I think you're right. right. No, but Osterhase yeah. is, is Oster one word, I promise is one you. Word. Yeah, right. it is one word. So an incorrect challenge, unfortunately, Josie. Another point to Stephen. The Easter Bunny is still with you, Stephen. 24 seconds, starting now. I think the Lagomorphs, the uh, Lepus, the uh, Rabbit, uh, the uh, Hare... Oh, Kuma, Nish, you've challenged. Hesitation? Yes, he said, er. Yes! Oh, very good. <laughs> so, uh, well listened, um, Nish, and um, uh, you've got the subject. Oh, dear. Yes. <laughs> ah, the consequence. Yes. <laughs> Your virgin... Attempt. 20 seconds. Oh, this could be misunderstood, couldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's the, 20 uh, seconds of my are available for the Easter money with you, Nish, starting now. Easter, or as I like to think of it, White People's Diwali. It's a very <laughs> interesting festival, particularly one that's commemorating a death with a small rabbit. I've always found it very strange, especially when I was at school and we would be told that uh, Jesus Christ... Oh, yes, children <sighs> know I don't care. What? Oh. Oh. I want to tell you about Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> so your challenge? Hesitation. Yes, it is. Yeah. The, uh, the... Right. Cool. So five seconds yeah. to go, Josie. You've yeah. got him with five seconds on the Easter Bunny, starting now. He put metal coat hangers up them <laughs> and then fainted and projectile bum... <laughs> <laughs> So on that particular um, saving thought, um, Josie was speaking, so she's got two points, Stephen's got three, and so is Jenny. Nish has got one. Uh, it's all very close. And Nish, we'd like you to begin the next round. Lovely. And the subject is the Great Fire of London. Great. I don't know whether you know much about it, but tell us what you Let's know. Let's find out. <laughs> In 60 seconds, if you can, starting now. The Great Fire of London is my sort of history. It's very much the Ron Seal of events. It does exactly what it says on a tin. <laughs> there was a great fire. Uh, Jenny Challenge. Oh, there was a gap. There, there was, was, a, was gap. a gap, yes. yes. I forgot but, what but I was talking about for a second. <laughs> I, was, I was genuinely... Oh, no, Don't Jenny, worry, Jenny, Rich, I can promise you I know so little <laughs> about the Great Fire of London, apart from its title. You'll have this back <laughs> in seconds. No, I'll tell you what, we'll give it back to him now, because he's a, bit, a newcomer on the show. Yeah. Are you? <laughs> The Jenny, benefit Jenny. of the doubt. Sweet, sweet pity. <laughs> oh, a double no, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's very welcome to have the round back. <laughs> Listen, I'm always very fair. Yes. You get a point for a correct challenge. Oh, that's challenge. fine then, Nicholas. Yes, you get your point. <laughs> and, but you are not, you were interrupted, so you get a point for that. And you keep the subject, 
the Great Fire of London, and there are 51 seconds starting now. Good luck, Nish. Sadly, the rumour that a film was being made about the Great Fire of London starring Vin Diesel as Samuel Pepys and Daniel Day-Lewis as the Great Fire. <laughs> How is he going to play the fire? The man is an absolute chameleon. Was sadly proved to have been fabricated by me. Uh, Josie Chan. Too sadly. Oh. Too much sadly, oh. yes. It's True. a difficult You're game. Right. It's it? really hard, but I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> Josie and I are quite menopausal. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Josie, a correct challenge. 35 seconds available. The Great Fire of London starting now. Well, my family came down to visit me in London. We were outside Buckingham Palace watching all the pomp and ceremony going on. My great nephew was on the shoulders of his dad, and I said, James, are you enjoying this? He said, Yes, but when are we going to go to Pudding Lane? Because although he's only five, he's got this obsession with the Great Fire of London. He's either going to become a historian or an arsonist. <laughs> so we got off at Monument, where that great great obelisky thing is, and there we saw where the great fire... <laughs> He's mad about it. Uh, you know about the great... Do you know what year it took place? 1666. 1666. Yes, September I know. September the 2nd, It's I so easy to remember, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> right, Jenny, we'd like you to begin the next round. Oh, at the end of that round, uh, Jenny, Claire and Josie have been the lead. The ladies are leading the men by two mm. points each. Uh, Jenny, my generation. Tell us something about my generation in this game starting now. I was born in 1960, so my generation is younger than the Who's, and I have no desire to die before I get old. In fact, with all the new drugs around, I'll probably live till 110, getting on everybody's nerves. Shall I tell you what sums up my generation? Stuff like the Bay City Rollers, flared trousers, cheesecloth shirts, puff sleeve blouses, platform shoes, poodle perms, and David Bowie, new romantics, Hot noodles, they were a novelty, and toast toppers, Vesta chow mains, and disgusting curries. What a generation we have been. All these exciting stuffs that we have introduced to the world and enjoyed. And I'll tell you something. <laughs> You covered it all perfectly, but you did leave out Arthur Haynes and Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> <laughs> they were sadly pre my generation, <laughs> Nicholas. No doubt. It was the 60s when we became famous. Ah. <laughs> yes, ah. it was. Doesn't matter, Nish, you challenged first. I challenged slightly because I was genuinely getting frightened. <laughs> it was, I thought you were going to list everything that had ever happened in history. It was amazing. <laughs> that was my intention before you interrupted. No, no, she, she was wonderful. <laughs> All those things did occur in the 60s right. when she was born. Well, well done. And there are 14 seconds left, Nish, if you need it. My generation starting now. My generation may well be the worst generation of all time. All we do is sit around... Uh, Josie Chan. To all, Sammy. Oh. Oh. I'm getting better. <laughs> Jenny, you've got him with seven seconds it's to go, Josie's. with another point, of course. My generation starting now. Oh, sorry, is it... it was Josie, no, no, wait yeah. a minute, John. Yes, it was oh, sorry, Josie. You challenged. You've got a correct challenge. I haven't pressed the buzzer yet. Okay. I mean, I haven't pressed a nipple. What? <laughs> On the stopwatch. <laughs> I think Clement Freud's you've got <laughs> there. Clement Freud's grandfather is watching this. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, and he's wow. having a great time. <laughs> yeah. Seven seconds available. My generation, Josie, starting now. I still think of my generation really peaking in the 80s, and what I notice about my generation is that there were no. <laughs> <laughs> Very <laughs> Speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point. She's just ahead of Jenny Eclair, and then one point behind her are Nish Kumar and Stephen Fry. Right, we're back with you to begin, Stephen. Oh, my. And, oh, a lovely subject. I'm sure you can go on it. Salvador Dali. Mm. 
Mm. Will you tell us something about that great painter in this game starting now? Great Catalonian Salvador Dali, born in, I believe, 1906, or as close as makes no difference, he made an enormous reputation in the 1930s by joining the Surrealist movement headed by André Breton, who fell out of favour with him, really, and he called him Avida Dollars, which is an anagram of his name because he disliked Dali's love of money. But his great achievements as a painter really cannot be denied. The persistence of memory, perhaps the most famous, melting clocks in the distance and others being eaten by ants, hugely influenced by Henri Bergson, of course. Um, <laughs> Josie Chance. Two Andres, I'm afraid. No, that was an Henri. Oh, oh did Henri you do Henri? Henri. <laughs> <laughs> One French name is much like another. I'm so Henri sorry. Bergson, I Henri and Andre, I'm sorry, of, uh, it's my tinnitus. Time and free will. <laughs> <laughs> Not no. at all, now. You're actually sort of I fun. I was really enjoying it, though. <laughs> I know, it was very, very interesting. And he's going to continue. And he's got another point, and sorry, he's got Steve. the subject. He's got 23 seconds, Salvador Dali, starting now. Swans reflected as elephants and vice versa, one of his greater paintings, too. A crucifixion, which no one can forget who has ever seen it. Immense energy and use of space. Very few had his realistic style as... Oh, Nish, you challenge. He knows too much and this is unfair. <laughs> <laughs> he does know a lot, but then so do you. With the, it's the competitions there, Nish. We enjoyed your comment, so we give you a bonus point for that. And, uh, but you get a point for being interrupted, okay. Stephen, and there are still ten seconds available. Uh, Salvador Dali, starting now. After the war, he became something of a celebrity in America. He appeared on game shows. His moustaches were wonderfully famous, of course. Bigotes was his name for them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Stephen, you do bring an erudition to the show, which is wonderful. <laughs> and you kept going to the whistle win, getting that extra point. You're now equal in the lead with Josie Lawrence, and you're both two points ahead of Jenny Eclair and Nish Kumar. And, Josie, we're back yeah. with you to begin. A bitter pill. Mm. 60 seconds, starting now. Well, a bitter pill is like when you get a part in a play and then suddenly it's taken away from you because Clarissa knows the producer. You realise you'll never have that leading role and it's a bitter pill to swallow. Let's not sugarcoat this, people say. But the real bitter pills go back centuries. The first pill was invented by the Egyptians who used to coat the pill in... Oh, Jenny challenged. Two coats. Yeah. Sug sugar sugar co coated was the first Oh, time. she's clever. Oh, you'd think yeah. she'd played this game before. No. <laughs> and I have to listen like that. I got it was sugar coated, she said. Yeah, she she kind mm. of yes. Yeah. Mm. She mumbled slightly, but I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so it was an incorrect challenge, my was darling. It? Yes. So you've got a point? You've got another point, and you've got uh, 28 seconds if you need it. A bitter pill starting now. Why do pills taste bitter? Have you ever had a, an aspirin stuck on the back of your tongue? It's blimmin' awful, isn't it? My ma used to give me orange juice to swallow. Oh! oh. Stephen Chan. Yeah, it was a oh. bitter pill to swallow earlier. Yeah, then you're yes, quite right. Double yes, swallow. Yes, swallow. Yeah. Too much swallowing quite there. Right. Orange juice does work. <laughs> so, Stephen, you've got in with... Uh, 16 seconds on a bitter pill starting now. Well, they told me you were dead, Heraclitus. They brought me bitter news to bear and bitter pills to shed, which isn't quite how the poem goes, but one of my favourites. Yes, life is filled with bitterness and a kind of astringent darkness which can occasionally disappoint, and yet often... <laughs> So Stephen Fry was then speaking as a whistle when gained that extra point and has increased his lead by one over Josie Lawrence, Nish Kumar and uh, Jenny Eclair in that order. Uh, Nish, we're back with you to begin. It's uh, subject here, killing two birds with one stone. Mm. Will you talk about that subject in this game starting now? Killing two birds with one stone is surprisingly difficult. 
There's a very specific technique to it. A lot of people might assume that you should stand one bird in front of the other. However, it is preferential to go for what 10-pin bowling enthusiasts call a 7-10 split. <laughs> Having the birds stand next to each other, throwing the stone... Uh, Stephen there was two others there was next to each other oh, and yeah. one next in front to, of yes. the other. So yes, I, was, well. yeah. Yeah. I feel cruel, because that was a good... Call, and I've got nothing to say on the subject. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Let's oh, hear yes. from you then. Okay. Now, 38 seconds. You've got killing two birds with one stone, Stephen, starting now. By telling you what an arid, sterile and, frankly, uninteresting subject this is, and yet talking about it, I'm killing two birds with one stone because I'm getting the subject out and, I hope, extending time. Um, niche challenge. Was there a repetition of subject? There was a repetition of subject. Oh, yes, you were absolutely spot on. Well, listen... <laughs> So you've got it back with another point, of course. 27 <laughs> seconds available. Killing two birds with one stone, starting now. Stone choice is an incredibly important part of killing two birds with one stone. <laughs> the temptation would be to go for a heavy boulder. However, a light, thin pebble is preferential. <laughs> Stephen challenge. I, I was going to challenge preferential earlier for being the wrong word when yeah. you meant preferable, but... Yeah. Um... <laughs> Nonetheless, it is a repetition of that uh, odd, <laughs> oddly selected word. I, I got too excited that I, I had a correct give you a challenge bonus and it went point to my head. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but, I um, I'm sorry, it's shameful. But I you know. have got a correct challenge. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, and you've got 14 seconds. You tell us something more about killing two birds with one stone starting now. It's cruel and unpleasant to kill any bird, you might think. On the other hand, I have to confess to being a bit of a hypocrite. I eat chicken. Therefore, I am responsible for the killing of birds. I can't deny it. More than. Uh, Two, I suspect, oh. really. Lots of them. Oh, oh, before the whistle went, Jenny. Oh, yes. Uh, there was a dreadful uh. Yeah. I know there was. Yeah. Not a it's dreadful repetition. one, but it was definitely... Not repetition. Yeah. I mean, the other one, hesitation. I wasn't hesitating. <laughs> I wasn't hesitating so much as using the word er. <laughs> it, it kind of gives balance and rhythm uh, to a sentence, don't you? <laughs> I find uh, it has... Uh, you listen to Churchill there, he mm. never hesitates. He was... But er, uh, he says er, uh, <laughs> a lot. And, and, you know, it's just there. Uh, Stephen, you're absolutely right, but you can't do it in just a minute. Oh, fair <laughs> So, Jenny, you're correct. He did <laughs> say er, uh, <laughs> and you've got half a second to go. <laughs> Killing two birds with one stone, starting now. I was accidentally... <laughs> So, Jenny Clare was speaking as a whistle when gained an extra point. She's moved forward. She's still in fourth place with Nish Kumar. Uh, no, third place, because just one ahead is Josie Lawrence and another couple ahead is Stephen Fry. And, Jenny, it's your turn to begin. A holiday in Wales. Strange subject, but uh, not a strange subject. Wales is lovely, and I love going there. Gosh, you've got to be so careful in this show, haven't you? Um, <laughs> Oh, I love Wales. I really do. I love the people. I love the way they speak. It's so sexy. I used to have a lot of Welsh girlfriends. It was the voice that got me. Or, oh, you know, it's a very sexy way of speaking, isn't it? Or oh, you don't agree with me, all right? I get on with the show. A holiday in Wales, Jenny. 60 seconds as starting now. Well, this is very pertinent because I am about to go on holiday to Wales with my family. I am so excited because it's such a... Stephen Shand. There's two becauses there. Oh. Yeah, oh. Sorry. Sorry. I was so excited sorry. about going to lovely oh. Wales. Mm, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, Stephen, you got in on the point, of course. Mm. 50 seconds are still available. A holiday in Wales is starting now. So Jonah said to his wife, darling, where should we go on holiday <laughs> this year? <laughs> And she replied, I don't know, my love, have you any ideas? He said, well, there's a dolphin, possibly we could go in. Or what about Wales? I love having a holiday in Wales. Nish challenge. Repetition of holiday? That's in the... It's on the subject. Oh, oh, yeah, you sorry. can't repeat the words in the subject. Oh. The Just happy to be involved, guys. Yeah. <laughs> You are involved. You're very, very, you're very good. You're in, you're in third place. No, you're in fourth place now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. An incorrect challenge, so Stephen, another point to you. 35 seconds, a holiday in Wales, starting now. I have a dim memory of somewhere called Caswell Bay when I was about seven. Ice creams came into it in a motorboat. I was invited to go with the owner of it as a sort of passenger, I suppose, and I loved it. It was extraordinary how hard the water was. It spanked like concrete. Amazing feeling, really, isn't it? Something as fluid. Um, uh, Jenny, you've challenged. Oh, I just think we have to be careful. He said spanked. I saw it on the bit. 
much deviating from the nice, clean family fun show that this has always been, Nicholas. Yeah, but you, if you're in a boat and you come down with a heavy thing, that is spanking. Yeah. So uh, I don't think it's a... Um, That's a, fair a, enough. It's fair enough, isn't it? Yes. I can live with it. You can live with it. 17 seconds are still available. Uh, Stephen, a holiday in Wales is starting now. One of my favourite poems is Dylan Thomas's A Child's Christmas in Wales. Very beautiful, sentimental, yes, but somehow more than that. It has a quality of charm and cosiness and beauty that we associate with an infant's Xmas, if you want to call it that. Something immemorial. <laughs> <laughs> Why? So at the end of that round, Stephen Fry, with extra points for speaking as a whistle and being interrupted, has increased his lead at the end of the round, all the other three, because they're almost equal in second place. And Stephen, <laughs> this is going to be the final round. Oh. 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 oh! Let me give this situation as we go into the final round. Right. Well, um, Nish, who's only never played a game before, He's equal with Jenny Eclair in third place, but only one point ahead is Josie Lons, and a few points ahead of her is Stephen Fry, and Stephen, we're back with you to begin. Uh, the subject now is earplugs. Good Lord. Could you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? Well, these can be wax or silicon and are thrust into the lug holes in order to defend you against some unwelcome noise. It can be gunshots, or in my case, it can be snoring, of course. Yes, oh, it can be, it can uh, be, it Josie can challenge. be. No, good yeah. point. A repetition of it can uh, be. Mm, can mm. be, can be. Josie, you've got in with 49 seconds, if you wanted, on earplugs starting now. I always find those wax earplugs that are meant to help you when you go for a swim are dreadful because water always collects behind them and makes it much worse. You must never, ever mistake earplugs for ear pugs, those tiny dogs that live in your <laughs> orifices. They're dreadful creatures. Ah. Uh, Jenny, you challenged. Two dreadfuls. Yes. Oh! Yes. Oh. So, Jenny, you got in on the last round, too, which is good. 28 seconds available. Earplugs are starting now. Earplugs are really important if you happen to be staying in a hotel where a young couple are having very noisy sex in the room next door. It is disgraceful. So, the only other option, if you are sans earplugs, is to turn up the Antiques Roadshow. That'll teach them. And go for a long walk until they have exhausted themselves. Can you tell that this is from personal experience? <laughs> I actually... <laughs> so, Jenny Eclair was in speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point. And the final situation is that Nish Kumar, who's not played the game before, but he finished up in a very fine fourth place. <laughs> I say very fine, because he was only one point behind Jenny Eclair, who's played it a number of times, and she was only <laughs> one point behind Josie Lawrence, who's only played it a number of times, but there were a few points behind Stephen Fry, who has played it a few times, and so we say, Stephen, you are the winner this week. <laughs> so, Jenny, it remains me to say thank you to these four fine players of the game, Stephen Fry, Josie Lawrence, Nish Kumar and Jenny Eclair. I thank Hayley Sterling, who's helped me with the score, and she's blown her whistle with such delicacy when the 60 seconds elapsed. We're grateful to our producer, Victoria Lloyd. We're indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this amazing game, and we're very indebted to this lovely audience here in the Radio Theatre. They've cheered us on our way magnificently. From them, from me, Nicholas Parsons, and the team, goodbye, thank you, and tune in again the same time when we play Just a Minute! <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Nicholas Parsons, 
And as the minute walls fades away, once more it's my huge pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country, but around the world, but to welcome to the program for exciting, dynamic personalities. And they are seated on my right, Paul Merton and Pam Ayres, and seated on my left, Graham Norton and Rufus Hunt. Would you please welcome all four of them? And as usual, I'm going to ask them to speak on a subject that I will give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. Beside me is this Hayley Sterling, who's going to help me with the score, and she'll blow the whistle when the 60 seconds have elapsed. And we begin the show this week with Graham Norton. Graham, who better? And the subject is Breakfast at Tiffany's. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. I don't wish to complain, but it's a very limited menu. I don't know if anyone else has been, but really, it's shocking. They shouldn't even advertise it as an actual breakfast. I expect things like eggs, or a light waffle, or maybe some crispy bacon. Oh, do you know what's lovely? Those hash browns they have in America, they're great, aren't they? With a little bit of bean on top, just to make them a bit softer and more moist. But at Tiffany's, none of the above, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Somebody mentioned something about carrots, but who wants that for breakfast? Nobody is who, unless you're a rabbit or a vegetarian. I am neither of those things. Hence my severe disappointment with the range of breakfast items available in that store there on Fifth Avenue in New York. It's the center of Manhattan. Surely they could provide something of nutritious value to the passerby <laughs> before 11 o'clock when, say, brunch kicks in. We're talking breakfast, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I'm saying. Well, that doesn't often happen in this I'll, game. I'll Stop. get my coat. <laughs> Starting with a subject and finishing with a subject and doing it on the very first subject that we start with. And of course in this game you get a point for speaking when the whistle goes and you get a bonus point because you were not interrupted. So at the end of the round, Graham, you're the only person to have any points. <laughs> and, uh, you're Let's in just the stop time now, shall we? <laughs> uh, Rufus, will you begin the next round? The subject is Simnel Cake. <laughs> I don't think you can get that for breakfast at Tiffany's. So, Nicholas, Nicholas you, one more time. What's it? Simnel cake. Simnel. S Simnel. S I M N E L. Okay. Simnel. Oh yes. Simnel cake. <laughs> the dawn of recognition and complete confusion on the face of Graham Norton. And uh, Rufus, you seem unfazed by it. So, well, I'm. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad of that. <laughs> But would you try and talk on the subject? 60 seconds if you need it, starting now. It does put me in something of a moral quandary, I shall confess, because backstage I saw a clipboard, and on that clipboard was written the word Simnel Cake. Uh, oh! Pam. Oh, Pam. Sorry. You no, did, you're right to, Pam. It was clipboard. You said clipboard twice. Sorry about that. Oh. She lied. Yes. <laughs> So, Pam, that is a correct challenge. She did repeat it, and so you have a point for that. You take over the subject of Simnel Cake. 51 seconds, starting now. Simnel Cake is baked traditionally at Easter and features a thick, sticky layer of marzipan through the middle and a layer of the same... Oh, oh yes, oh. grand challenge, yes. Repetition of layer. Yes, yeah, there were too many layers, yeah. Pam. So, Graham, a correct challenge? There's still 40 seconds available. Tell us something about Simnel Cake starting now. Well, I don't think there are many people on planet Earth who don't know that Simnel Cake is something that is baked traditionally at Easter. <laughs> and there's a thick layer of marzipan through the middle of it. There is something else, but I can't quite remember because I wasn't listening to every detail. But the important facts are it's cake, and I'm sure people eat it, and it probably contains sugar of some sort. Maybe eggs. I can't be a hundred hundred percent certain. Now, Simnel Cake... <laughs> Poor chance. We're, we're teetering on hesitation. He was teetering, yes. <laughs> and what he was saying was absolute bollocks. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, but once you run out of what Pam said, then it was, uh, I think it's cake that there might be sugar in it, people eat it. I'm sorry, There's Paul... people at home trying to take down these recipes. <laughs> They should have booked Mary Berry. They I should have done. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't give a bonus point for bollocks, and... Um, <laughs> but I can say a, a correct challenge, Paul. And there are 13 seconds for you on Simnel Cake. 
Stardew now. It's the cultured tones of Nicholas Parsons saying I can't give any points for bollocks, which set me off laughing. <laughs> well, I wish I had some Simnel cake here. They say the silhouette of Simnel cake resembles the Taj Mahal at moonlight. But sometimes... <laughs> So Paul Merton begins the whistle away and gain that extra point. And he's now just behind Graham Norton. And then comes Pam Ayres and then Rufus Hound in that order. Uh, Pam, we'd like you to begin the next round. Oh, gosh, it's getting quite an erudite show, isn't it? Copernicus. <laughs> His recipe for Simnel cake, wasn't it? Mm. <laughs> Simnel cake, Copernicus, but there we are. Pam, do your best. I'm sure you know all about it. You'll probably put in one of your poems, haven't you? Copernicus. No, as, as it happens, no. <laughs> With 60 seconds available if you need it, Pam. Copernicus, starting now. A less scholarly person than myself, indeed an ignoramus, might look at the name Copernicus and mispronounce it Copernicus, <laughs> a garment of extreme discomfort due to its inflexible nature. However... <laughs> Copernicus, the man, unlike myself, was a mathematical genius who revealed to the world a new theory about the universe because he believed, unlike Ptolemy, you will recall, that, <laughs> that the universe circled around the sun. Um, uh, Paul challenge. I don't think the universe circles around the sun. <laughs> That's deviation. Not the universe, no. No, not the universe. Our planets do, but not the universe. Yeah, I meant to say our solar system, but it came out wrong because I was flustered. <laughs> <laughs> but darling, you went for a, quite a long time, and um, <laughs> you went for actually for 38 seconds. Oh. And there are 22 left, but Paul oh, had a correct challenge. Not mine, sadly. No. <laughs> but Paul, you, do you know anything about Copernicus? No, and I don't need 22 seconds either. <laughs> Well, do your best, yeah. Copernicus, 22 seconds, are starting now. Copernicus looked at the Simnel cake and he thought to himself, who would hate me enough to push that through my letterbox? <laughs> <laughs> who would? Who would hate me? Pam, you've challenged. This is a load of old cobblers. <laughs> it does not relate to Copernicus. No, Simnel cake going through his letterbox, no. but he has no connection with Copernicus. So I agree with your deviation, and you've got the subject back, which you didn't want, but you've got it. Uh, 17 seconds, Copernicus, Pam, starting now. Copernicus kept to himself his discovery because he feared it would get him in trouble with the church, which was likely to bestow upon you a death of horrible and unimaginable type if you uh, argued... Uh, oh. oh, Paul, you challenged. Hesitation. There was an er in there, it. Pam, yes. Paul, three seconds, Copernicus starting now. Copernicus stood up in the middle of his house, which is historical fact. <laughs> so Paul Merton was then speaking as the whistle win and gained that extra point, and he's increased his lead ahead of Graham Norton, Pam Ayres, and Rufus Hound in that order. Paul, we'd like you to begin the next round. A more basic subject now, keeping your feet on the ground. 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. I'm not quite sure what my uh, estimation of my intellectual capacity is, but keeping your feet on the ground as opposed to Copernicus is a completely different subject. If we'd said to the Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orville, keep your feet on the ground, where would we now? We'd be waiting at Gatwick, but there'd be no airport there. <laughs> say to people the advice to keep your feet on the ground is fairly sound but sometimes we must also dare to fly throw ourselves off the ledge hoping that the air currents will lift our wings above the horizon so we saw in the zephyrs uh graham challenge you won't fly if you jump off so you'll just fall to the ground i didn't say i didn't say That's terrible a, advice might be a ground floor ledge i didn't say well <laughs> I speak metaphorically. I know, it's dead. people who listen to this all over the world, don't they, Nicholas? Yeah, yeah. Well, I agree that people <laughs> do chuck themselves off ledges when they've heard just a minute. I agree. <laughs> the statistics are frightening. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, the image you conveyed, Paul, was that if you were very high your up... Your heart soars, your imagination soars. It's a very difficult decision, isn't it? No, no, I don't mind. Give it to Graham. I don't mind either. <laughs> Paul, keep it. Well, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, Graham, and say that you have 30 seconds. You tell us something about keeping your feet on the ground. Yes. Yeah. 30 seconds, starting now. Keeping your feet on the ground is one of the simpler things you can do in life. It's really your default setting, I would say. <laughs> because if they aren't, you are jumping. And you can't do that for very long, unless you're Jane Fonda, who's been doing it for over 70 years. <laughs> She's 100 
than two now, but ever so fit. Did you see her the other night? She was wearing an extraordinary sort of toilet roll holder as a dress. I didn't understand it myself, but she had a great jawline for a woman of her age. Uh, Pam challenge. Deviation. What? Uh, Jane Fonda's jawline, uh, which to me, a duffer though I may be, does not seem to have much to do with keeping your feet on the ground. That Curse is... you, Pam. You rumbled me. I... <laughs> And Pam, you've got him with one second to go. Oh. And keeping your feet on the ground, starting now. I once did a... <laughs> so Pam, uh, speaking of the whistle, Wayne Gaines, she's now one point behind Paul Merton, equal with Graham Norton, and they're all ahead of Rufus Hound. And Rufus, we're with you to begin, and the subject now is the Rat Pack. I'm sure you know something about it, but tell us more in this game starting now. The Rat Pack was a phrase used to describe a group of performers who loved one another's company. Indeed, they performed as a band of brothers. Uh, they were time... Oh, you absolutely... <laughs> Rufus. <laughs> oh, the poor man's crying. Isn't he? I know it's a difficult game, but Rufus... Yes. Darling boy. Oh. Yes, Rufus. <laughs> Yes. You're giving a wonderful performance. Well, you're, you're I wish wiping his eyes with his <laughs> microphone at the moment. A uh, bit of advice I give is that even if you stumble, keep going. It yeah. might be generous. This I accept. Right. I, it's, it's more of an existential pain that I feel at the moment. <laughs> I think we're all feeling that pain. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> but Pam, you challenge first, right? I did. I think it was hesitation. Yes, I think Rufus did. rather ran out of steam. And he, he collapsed. I didn't run out of steam, I just ran out of ability. <laughs> <laughs> no, your ability's got you on the show, but I don't know how to finish that sentence. I'm going to write that down. That <laughs> 51 seconds, Pam, on the Rat Pack starting now. One morning, my father was riding his bicycle steadily towards Farringdon beside a stubble field. To his surprise, he heard a tremendous rustling in the corn, and looking to his left, he saw an enormous pack of rats which stretched from one side of the pasture to the other. Oh, and the rats. Oh. Uh, Rufus challenge. Hesitation. Yes, yes we call was. that hesitation, Rufus. Well, listen, you've got your first point. And, um... <laughs> I said that to get the audience on your side, Rufus, so have confidence now. OK. Right, OK, ready. Today That's... the revolution no, begins. I, oh. <laughs> I do say begin now, because you have played the game once before, haven't you? Oh, just and, the once. And I... <laughs> but but and to I be didn't... honest, Nicholas, it was so long ago, I've sort of... <laughs> I'll give him a bonus point for that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there are still 30 seconds available, Rufus. The Rat Pack starting now. The Rat Pack were these <coughs> men who had come together to give people... Paul challenge. Well, it kind of was hesitation. It was a definite hesitation. Yeah. Paul had a correct challenge. He gets a point for that. But I'm going to be generous and say, you can keep the subject. 26 seconds still available. The Rat Pack starting now. They were show business titans who truly loved one another. The chairman of the board was Frank Sinatra. Old blue eyes, he seemed to be the leader of the piece. Whilst Dean Martin was the court jester, if you will. A man who was drunk the entire time. Leading, oh! <laughs> Pam, new challenge. Uh, and there are nine seconds still available. The rat pack starting now. It is a well-known fact that rats migrate across large areas. Uh, Rufus challenge. Uh, repetition of rats. Yes, because oh. she talked about this colony of rats before, didn't she? She did. Yes, did. well, listen, Rufus. <laughs> well, you're not for the duffer of the game after all, are you? What? <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't listen to him, Rufus. Don't listen. <laughs> Just play the game, you're okay, very good. Okay, okay. Absolutely. And you've got him with four seconds to go. Okay. okay. So keep okay, going. Come on. Keep your breath. Four seconds. The Rat Pack starting now. It also led to a change in the way that Americans viewed race because Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> so we must pound with all kinds of uh, aggression there, pull himself up, and he's only two points behind Pam Ayers and Graham Norton and free behind Paul Merton, who's our leader. Pam, it's your turn to begin. The subject is free verse. We might have something about verse with you, my darling. 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. 
A man standing uh, shouting at the top of his voice, buy my free verse, only £25 a ream, guaranteed to bring tears to your eyes, uh, could not be accused of actually offering free verse because free verse is a type of unstructured poetry. A good example would be the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Pastures. Here, the straight jacket of just a minute causes me to pause. A good example of something which is. Oh, yes, oh, Graham, listen. Blow. Well, listen. Uh, yes, well, it was a good example. It was Graham. a good example, yes. yes. There we are. And that big laugh that came in there was we were all crossing ourselves as pun to the sun. <laughs> Uh, Graham, a correct challenge. 21 seconds available. Free verse starting now. Free verse is essentially stuff that doesn't rhyme, I believe. Is it not, Pam? Mm. Pam is nodding at me now. I've said Pam three times. Uh, <laughs> Paul, <laughs> Pam. Repetition of Pam. <laughs> Self-confessed. <laughs> so another point of I was thinking, isn't it odd we don't speak to each other during it? And then I said your name three times and I realised that's why we don't do that. <laughs> Paul, 15 seconds still available. Free verse starting now. When you wander through the worlds of poetry, there are many different forms, but free verse is something that particularly catches my eye. Perhaps the finest writer of free verse poetry that this country has ever known, maybe even the world, I would say, is undoubtedly Sir Henry... <laughs> so Paul Martin was then speaking as the whistle when gained that extra point. He's increased his lead by one over Pam Mayers and Graham Norton together, and then a little bit further behind is Rufus Hunt. Paul, we're back with you to begin the subject, the Hebrides. Tell us something about those lovely islands in this game, starting now. Well, I bought this magazine about men who like to dress up as brides, but it wasn't he brides, it was Hebrides. <laughs> I made a huge error. I'd taken out a year-long subscription by then, <laughs> so when the postman shoves it from me letterbox every Monday, I say, I thought it was a monthly publication, he says, well, it comes out weekly these days. So anyway, <laughs> what are we talking? What's the subject? <laughs> the uh, I've got to get out of the Hebrides. What? Yes, but you, you paused then. I know, I've forgotten what the subject was. And, uh, <laughs> there was hesitation, I think. There feel. was hesitation. Yeah, there was hesitation. Yes, you so, forgot the subject. Uh, Graham got in first yeah. for, the, for the point, of course, for a correct challenge. The Hebrides with you, Graham, are starting now. The Hebrides share quite a lot with belly buttons, in that there are inner and outer. <laughs> the outer are the oldest ones, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Pam challenge. Uh, outer, repetition of outer. Oh, you're quite uh, right. Yes. Oh, Pam. I know my belly buttons. You're like a white witch. <laughs> Pam, you have 34 seconds. The Hebrides are starting now. I believe Harris is one of the Hebrides, and on a visit to that island, I entered a primitive habitation as a tourist. In the centre of the building was a fire. Consequently, the establishment was so full of black smoke that you couldn't actually see any details of the conditions in which the ancient people lived. Another interesting point about that... Uh, <laughs> Graham Challenge. That point wasn't interesting. <laughs> I, I feel I like speak you for the room. In... <laughs> it was just some smoke in a hut. But what a strange audience, they applaud insults. <laughs> uh, so, Graham. No, no, facts. Facts. It actually wasn't very interesting, was it? No. But I'm afraid it doesn't come within the rules of just No, it a does minute. because she was deviating because she said another interesting fact and she hadn't already given us one. So that's a oh, deviation. I know, but to her it could be interesting. Oh, that's I, a silly I topic. It was interesting. <laughs> I have to interpret the rules, and that is anything, right. I think so. Right. I so, thought it was very interesting indeed. I paid good money to go in there. <laughs> <laughs> Giving you the benefit of the doubt, Pam, a point to you, and there are still nine seconds on the Hebrides starting now. A famous product of the same island is a tweed, and my father adored that type of fabric and always had his... <laughs> So we come out and then speaking as a whistle wind, again that extra point, and she's taken the lead ahead of Paul Merton and Graham Norton, equal in second place, and then Rufus Hound. Graham, we're back with you to begin the subject, toast. Tell us something about toast in this game, starting now. I must admit, I'm not a fan of toast. Those people who go home of an evening going, oh, it's just lovely, I made myself some toast. I would never do that. Bread is already dry. Why make it more like that? Indeed, I could say drier, because that's a different word. <laughs> Rufus Challenge. Uh, how can you not like toast? <laughs> I, 
what the hell is going on to explain? No, but that's, <laughs> you're, that's just awful. <laughs> It's like, awful not like life. A you must... cake, isn't oh. it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then somebody is, Rufus. You know, it's your personal opinions that count yes. in this show. Yes. It, toast is essentially hot, stale bread. No, I listen. I'm I'm willing to take pretty much uh, moral relativism on all things. But this is the British Broadcasting Company, and if we can't just accept toast is inherently good, where are we? <laughs> You should have saved that for the show. I'll give Rufus a bonus point because we enjoyed what he said. But, Graham, you weren't interrupted because it was an incorrect challenge. And you keep the subject. 47 seconds on toast starting now. I don't think there's anything more delicious than some toast <laughs> in the morning. When you come down come from bed keep and me. you look at the cupboard you and you on. think to yourself, no, what your do I really right. want? <laughs> Rufus, you've challenged. Deviation? Yes, deviation. Oh, deviation. A man's allowed to change his mind. <laughs> Not Rufus spoke so eloquently about toast, no, no, he no. uh, talked me around. But you were so quick to pick up on that, Rufus. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so, deviation. He hated it before, and now he loves it. Right. So, Rufus, you have 36 seconds. Tell us something more about toast starting now. What in the name of all that's holy is there not to like about toast? It is essentially an edible plate. Yes, indeed, when it is warm, one places butter on top of it and that melts in, but in many ways, butter is itself... Oh. <laughs> uh, Paul, you challenge first. Yes, repetition of butter. Yes, repetition of butter. And uh, you've got a point. You have uh, 23 seconds. Toast is a subject starting now. Toast, of course, can be brown bread, white, granary, seeded. Marmite, with our other products available, is a, one of those things that if you spread on top of the surface of the bread, people... Uh, oh. Rufus challenge. A repetition of bread? Yes. yes. It is not the subject is toast. Well, listen. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and Rufus, you've got in with her 11 seconds to go. Toast. Starting now. One should see toast as a plateau on which other treats are placed. Sweet things, jams, marmalade, fruits of every description when crushed into the top... Well, Rupert, you've certainly got this audience on your side and you have leapt forward. You are now only one point behind Graham Norton and Paul Merton <laughs> and only two points behind Pam Ayers, who's still in the lead. And this is to be the last round. Oh. oh! Shame. And let me tell you, Rufus, who's done that magnificent leap forward, only one point behind Graham Norton and Paul Merton, and only two points behind our leader, Pam Ayres. And also, Rufus, it's your turn to begin. The subject... <laughs> <laughs> Rufus, please calm down. <laughs> This Listen, is... I know this is just show 1,000 to you, but this is my one chance at this <laughs> after today. But, 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 <laughs> but this is also radio. Visual humour doesn't work very well. Ventriloquism was huge at the birth of radio. <laughs> I don't see why mime can't be. <laughs> I'm not working you there, Rufus. You're working yourself. <laughs> right, it's with you to begin, and the subject is Glastonbury. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. Glastonbury, famous for so many things. This little spot in Somerset, chiefly known, I would imagine, for its arts festival. It's held, weirdly, in a place called Pilton and not Glastonbury at all, which is interesting about the nomenclature. Indeed, just round the corner from there is another small town called Street, which is mainly called such a thing, called oh, a cold. Paul challenge. A repetition of called. Yes. Called, yes. But well done. You went for 20 seconds. Paul, you have a correct challenge. You have the subject. 40 seconds to go. Glastonbury starting now. A lot of my friends' performers go to Glastonbury every year and I've been tempted once or twice. Inevitably, it's turned out to be an occasion where the rains have opened up four or five days before the event and everything becomes extremely muddy. I saw one party goer getting around by being pulled along in a rowing boat. Such was the condition of the ground that it was moist enough to sustain such a vessel. But, of course, the audiences at Glastonbury are all Always great fun. How they amused me to call you chippa chippa. Uh, <laughs> its Icelandic connections are well preserved. <laughs> Rufus, you challenge first. That was a deviation from language. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, yeah just yeah, it was a yeah. language you didn't understand. <laughs> 
Rufus, a correct challenge, yes, a point to you. And you're now equal with uh, Graham Norton and only one point behind our joint leaders. And you have 10 seconds still available. Keep going, Glastonbury, starting now. The festival hosts so many wonderful performers. David, yes, um, you're right. Did we have festival before? No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, last time I said vestibule. <laughs> I appreciate at distance it's... <laughs> it, it, it sounds it's... almost like the same word, yeah. Well, it's probably because you stand cl too close to the speakers. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you did say vestibule. I the think Glastonbury vestibule. Oh, come on. <laughs> you are bluffing now. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what to do because I want it to be equal. And they're all equal. <laughs> it wasn't... Typical lefty BBC. <laughs> <laughs> Repetition of B. <laughs> Paul, we give you a bonus point because you were a correct challenge and it was an in interesting thing. But for the sake of uh, fun and fairness, I'm going to leave it with uh, Rufus to continue. Where we'll does see... the fairness bit come into that? <laughs> I, I can see the fun. I mean, I, yeah. it's, I it's, fun, to... it's fun for Rufus. Because <laughs> even if he gets two points, he'll still be the winner. Oh, OK. Uh, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, where's the fun in this? I... <laughs> well, the audience are enjoying it. Six seconds, come on Rufus, give us a bit more on Glastonbury, starting now. Glastonbury represents a time when people of different stripes come together and sing with one voice, all garnered together under the umbrella. I wanted Rufus to finish because it's only the second time he's played the game and it was, you finish with style and panache. But it's only one point that separates all of them. Graham was in fourth place but only one point Behind equal in second place, Pam Ayres, who's won before, and Rufus, who's never won before. Equal in second place, Rufus Hound, Pam Ayres, and one point only ahead of them was Paul Merton. So we say, Paul, you are the winner this week. <laughs> well, we do hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute. And it only remains to say thank you to these four fine, exciting, humorous, eccentric players of the game, Paul Merton, Pam Ayres, Rufus Hound and Graham Norton. I thank Hayley Sterling, who's helped me with the score, blown her whistle with such style. We thank our producer, Victoria Lloyd. We're indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this amazing game. And we are grateful to this lovely audience who've cheered us on our way magnificently. So from the audience and from me, Nicholas Parsons, and the team, thank you. Tune in again the same time when we play Just a Minute! <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it's my huge pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country, but around the world, and also to welcome to the programme four exciting personalities. And they are seated on my right, Paul Merton, and Tim Rice, and seated on my left, Giles Brandreth and Esther Ransom. Will you please welcome all the four of them? And as usual, I am going to ask them to speak on a subject that I will give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. Beside me sits Hayley Sterling. She's going to help me keep the score. She will blow the whistle when the 60 seconds have elapsed. And we begin the show this occasion with Giles Brandreth. Giles, the subject in front of me is Kermit the Frog. <laughs> I don't know whether you're a fan or not, but please tell us something about that character in this game, starting now. Given that I have 60 seconds to fill on the subject of Kermit the Frog, I'd better go back to the beginning, which is probably 1955, when Jim Henson, a young American puppeteer, conceived this little creature for a five-minute show. Uh, Paul Challenge. Was he not Canadian? No. Sure, I don't know. No, I was a, well, I'm, I'm uh, wrong. He was American. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, that was an incorrect challenge, Paul. Yep. So, Giles has a point. He has 46 seconds still. Kermit the Frog starting now. 
The fellow was more lizard than frog initially, but by 1965, when he featured on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, the name Kermit the Frog was introduced by that entertainer. Subsequently, of course, there was Sesame Street, through which the triumph went on, and we became the Muppets in due course. The Bromance that started with... Uh, Tim Challenge. Repeat, of course, of course, and of due course. Of course, yes. Uh, Oh. oh yes. <laughs> well, listen, Tim. A wordsmith doesn't miss a so word like that, right, it's Tim? Going to you... be like that, is it? Yes. <laughs> it's nearly always like that, but it's very funny. <laughs> so, Tim, a correct challenge. Twenty-three seconds still available. Kermit the Frog, starting now. I had never realised until hearing Charles's fascinating piece that Kermit the Frog was actually French. Yes, this extraordinary amphibian has conquered the world, not only in America and... <coughs> Esther Challenge. Are you talking about Giles as the extraordinary amphibian who has <laughs> conquered... <laughs> Which isn't deviation at all, it's spot on, isn't it? Do you think uh, that Giles has conquered America? <laughs> <laughs> He's pushing his luck in this country. <laughs> Oh, yes, so there's no quarter given in this show, I can assure you, because this is the only second time you've played the game, but they're really biting in there, aren't they? Um, so what is the challenge? Yeah, I thought it was one of, one of those thoughts that the audience might like and you might give me as sort of patronising but charitable. Please give Esther a bonus point. I don't know why, but she's pleaded for one and she's got it. And it was the incorrect challenge, Tim, so you still have the subject. Eight seconds still available. Kermit the Frog, starting now. Kermit is a true icon of the entertainment world, up there with Vera Lynn, Al Bowley, Neil Diamond <laughs> and Barry Manilow. In this game, whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point. It was Tim Rice. Tim's in the lead at the moment, one ahead of Giles and Esther. And Esther, we'd like you to begin the next round. The subject is changing the flag. So will you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? Well, nobody should start changing the flag. Don't mess with it. It's a symbol of our national identity. It brings together four valid countries who care about each other, unite and prosper in this wonderful union, unless Scotland decides to leave us, in which case we will have to start changing the flag because we will have to remove the Cross of St Andrews, and that will make it look a little bare. So I have a suggestion. Why don't we put a different symbol in the middle which stands for England? And I would like to mention a cup of tea because, after all, <laughs> the Lebanon has the cedar in the centre of their flag. Why shouldn't we have our favourite beverage and it would have the great advantage over the current flag because you'd know which way up it was. <laughs> The poor tea. No. Oh. Oh. I think, audience, I was discombobulated by your kind applause. So <laughs> if you wouldn't mind holding your breath when, you're, when you can tell that I'm actually reaching the last lap and I may never get there. And then, as, uh, just, just stay on. Esther, excuse yes. me, you have been challenged, darling. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> but you're, I, I know what you're thinking, Esther. This is better than sex, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> It's oh, I'm going to hear that room. voice in my head when I go to sleep tonight. <laughs> Paul, your challenge. A uh, repetition of tea. And That's then, right, yes, yes, tea. Well, Paul, a correct challenge. He's got six seconds. Changing the flag, Paul, starting now. As the measles spread around the ship, we realised the quarantine flag would have to be hoisted right to the very... Mm. So Paul Martin was then speaking as a whistle wind, gained that extra point and they're all equal together uh, at the moment. And Tim, it's your turn to begin. The subject is Land's End. Tell us something about that geographical place in this game, if you can, starting now. If you leave London by the M3 and totter down the A302 plus one, then go through <laughs> several countries such as Wiltshire, Somerset, Devon, eventually you will arrive in Cornwall, at the very tip of this majestic, beautiful county known in its local dialect as Kerno, you will find Land's End. Frankly, Land's End is a little bit disappointing. It's rather like a tired Starbucks meeting a knackered Mac. I wouldn't really recommend a visit except for the- Giles Challenge. Intervention on behalf of the Cornwall Tourist Authority. 
Land's End is one of the most fascinating and beautiful places in the British Isles. Well, Tim doesn't think so. Deviation well, from the truth, I've been there. It's a beautiful place. No, I was just coming to the fact the views, God's creation of Land's End is sensational. What man has done to it is disastrous. No, no. You've, can I say, you've come no, here you today. <laughs> First of all, we had that terrible racial stereotyping, Kermit the Frog. Now, you've produced one of America's leading coffee exporters, and you're telling people that Land's End is a rough joint. I, I think it's just not on. I think this kind of abuse Just. Is, I fe I'm feeling almost bullied and hostile. We may have to call human resources. Giles, I'm glad you got that off your chest. <laughs> but I'm not going to allow it. Now, the point is that Tim is entitled to his opinion. You may disagree, Giles may disagree, but Tim, you get the benefit of the doubt and a point and 25 seconds, land's end, starting now. I was quite clearly, only an idiot would dispute this, referring to man's despoilment of land's end. What God and nature created is magnificent. Super Paul challenge. We did have magnificent before. We did. Yeah, we well done, Paul. Yes. That's the kind of challenge I like. Good. <laughs> Decent chance. Yes, yeah. a good middle class chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a challenge you could salute and fight for in a yeah. Well done, Paul and Tim. Right. Uh, Paul, you've got him with the correct challenge. 13 seconds to go. Land's End starting now. I looked up from the sea and I realised that my destiny lay in that small parcel. I see your challenge. I'm not sure whether one is supposed to challenge if someone says I twice. No. No. OK. <laughs> cleared that one up. <laughs> if they said it three times, I might have granted it. OK, I'll take but it back. I think it gets too pedantic if yeah. we go every I time. agree. But I challenge, agree. when he says, aye, aye, captain, on that ship, then you challenge. <laughs> so we don't charge any points on that, because uh, Esther was seeking for information, because she's only second time she played the game. Five seconds still with you, Paul. Land's End starting now. A rabbit moves slowly across the grass, bending its head to chew at a disconnect. <laughs> So Paul Martin is then speaking as a whistle when gain that extra point. He's in the lead at the end of that round, and he also begins the next round. Paul, the subject is filibustering. 60 mm. seconds starting now. Well, filibustering is a phrase that's often used to address speeches that are made in the Houses of Parliament and other legislature around the world <laughs> where someone is trying to drag out the time so that a vote can't take place on the issue under discussion. <laughs> <laughs> cool, thank goodness for that. <laughs> I'm extremely worried about Paul's health. <laughs> You're not the only one. <laughs> I think he's giving a demonstration of filibustering, but that's not within the rules of just a minute. You have to speak on the subject, not illustrate it. So I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, Hester. <laughs> and say that you have 40 seconds if you want it on filibustering starting now. I can't say I do want it because it's... Uh, Paul Charles. What would you challenge for, then? <laughs> Give oh, Paul a bonus point because we enjoyed the interruption. Yeah. Esther, you get a point because you were interrupted. And you have 39 seconds on filibustering starting now. It's rather worrying when you listen to the House of Commons debates and you realise that these people that we pay for are in fact attempting to prolong a debate simply in order to prevent some very good piece of law to be enacted. I know Giles has very often done this. He's known for his filibustering. In fact, they used to call him the filibusterer of the House of Commons. And that is why I think he took to television and the one show and just just a minute and all the many other things including the jumpers the books that he produces because the filibustering he did left such a scar upon the memories of all those in the house of commons <laughs> Well, Esther, you certainly have the audience on your side. Oh, uh, yes. Anyway, you were speaking as a whistle when you gained that extra point for doing so, and you're now just one point behind our leader, Paul Merton, and Giles were with you to begin, and the subject is the acid test. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. The acid test. I'm conscious that we're playing this wonderful game of just a minute in what would have been the year where we could have celebrated the 90th birthday of the late, great Kenneth Williams, the most wonderful practitioner of this extraordinary entertainment. Uh, Tim Chash. 
I'm afraid he stumbled. He uh, stumbled. Yes. We call that hesitation. So, Tim, you've got 45 seconds. You tell us something about the acid test starting now. Come back with me to 1958 and my days as a spotty schoolboy when we used to play around with hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid. In oh, 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 yes. Too much acid. No, it's the acid. <laughs> Acid on the card. Acid yeah. is on the card. So what's I, your challenge? I, I did buzz, but I, was, I forgot that acid was on the card. So it's an incorrect challenge. That certainly is. You're right. Mm. So, uh, Tim, you still have the subject. A point, of course. 35 seconds starting now. And the test that we used to carry out in the laboratory there was very exciting. Nay, daring. Poor <laughs> 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 oh, challenge. As soon as somebody says nay daring, you know they've got no idea what they're talking about. Hesitation, I'm afraid. No, it wasn't. That was no. a bit of old fashioned English. Oh, OK. And that's mm. the way they talked at prep school in 1958. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Benefit of the doubt to you, Tim. The acid test is still with you. 26 seconds starting now. If we did anything wrong during these exciting lessons, we would be thrashed within an inch of our lives and then flung into a cold bath and told to go on a nine mile run. It was, uh, uh, it was yes, terrific. Yes. I'm so horrified. I do hope that was deviation. Did they really do that to you? Oh, it was much worse. Than but that. isn't it more. <laughs> it's, fan like it's fantastic. Run. Here, you, when you call Childline, Esther answers the call immediately personally. <laughs> Fantastic. It, it's, it's taken him since 1958 to report the abuse, but well done. I think the thing that's particularly worrying is you were told to get into the bath and then do a nine and a half mile run. Uh, that yeah, was they why like so cool. naked and wet. Yeah. <laughs> I think we need to clear the building. Esther, I think he was exaggerating, I agree. And so we're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Where, they, where, where did they cane you? Where did they cane you? Was it near the Barnstable area? No, no. <laughs> I was Parsons 2, because my brother was Parsons 1. Bend over Parsons 2, hand me my cane. I'm going to make a mockery of your little behind. Whack, 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 whack. Oh, I can feel the pain now. Were well, you cane with a duck? <laughs> Very cruel, isn't it? No, I was, I was always fooling around, trying to make my chums laugh. Yeah. I, was a, I was a school clown. It was my embryonic desire to be an actor. Mm. And uh, it hasn't worked here. I don't... <laughs> no, you're all right, Esther. <laughs> and there are 14 seconds. You tell us something about the acid test starting now. Well, perhaps it was because I went to a girls' school, but our science lessons were incredibly dull. We did do the acid test, and I seem to recall it involved something called litmus paper, and one half of it went one colour, and the other half... Uh, one loaf, not half, half, the other bit... The one half and then the other half. Went a different... No. Repetition of half. A... No, she didn't get the other half out, Jess, no. before you challenged. Repetition of one. <laughs> I didn't say one. Well, yes, twice. one half went... And then you said one earlier. There was right. a repetition of one. During the discourse you've just been given. <laughs> I'm going to give The, the acid the... test will be what Nicholas decides. <laughs> Benefit of the doubt to our second time player of the game. I agree. Uh, Esther, I have huh? another point. And you have only two seconds oh. left. Yes, the acid test starting now. Personally, I always prefer the art classes, which... <laughs> So at the end of that round, Esther Ransom was speaking as a whistle wind, gained an extra point, and you will be pleased to hear she's taken the lead. Yeah. 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 Rice and Paul Merton. And Esther, it's your turn to begin. Hypnotising chickens. <laughs> 60 seconds if you want it. Starting now. Hypnotising chickens is a great art. It appears that you take the head of the chicken and you place it on a white line and then the poor poultry animal then begins to scutter its little... Tim challenge. Well, there were two pretty important then. <laughs> there were, weren't there? <laughs> and I think then being a four-letter word... Yeah. Yes, all right. I give you the benefit... I feel very bad I give about the benefit of the doubt. You've got your benefit of the doubt. So, um, point correct challenge, Tim. Hypnotising chickens starting now. You get your chicken put it on a chair, and look the little clucker in the face and say, <laughs> listen, mate, go to sleep. And they do. It is quite staggering. I've done this quite a lot with chickens over the... <laughs> Giles, if we can challenge a repetition of then, we can challenge a repetition of quite. Yes, indeed you can. You're so right. Hoist right. on my own petard. 
37 seconds, Giles, with you on hypnotising chickens starting now. It's extraordinary the fascination that hypnotising chickens has had on the literary world. Friedrich Nietzsche in Thus Spake Zarathustra gives a description of hypnotising chickens in a farm outside Zagreb. Later we find Emile Zola in one of his extraordinary novels talking about hypnotising chickens, but of course in French, because it can happen in that country as well. Well, we come to George uh, Orwell. That's a challenge. What is French for hypnotising chickens? Hypnotising chickens. <laughs> well done, Giles. I can't give you two points, but you get a point for an incorrect challenge. Ten seconds, hypnotising chickens starting now. There was an amazing pop group that I knew when I was on my acid trip back in the 60s called Hypnotising Chickens. We did a kind of dance which involved... <laughs> So Giles Randall was then speaking to Whistle Wayne, gained that extra point, and he has leapt forward. Uh, he's actually in fourth place, but the, only one point separates all of them. Tim writes, we ask you to begin the next round. Oh, a nice cultural subject. Oscar Wilde. Tell us something about that subject in this game starting now. Oscar Wilde was, of course, one of the greatest literary geniuses of the 19th century, and he died just as that century was coming to... Oh, just... Oh, sorry, a century. century. Yes, too many yes. centuries. Oh. And the 52 seconds still available, Giles. A point to you, of course. Oscar Wilde, starting now. Oscar Fingal of Rahati Wills Wilde. Uh, Paul Challenge. Isn't Giles the president of the Oscar Wilde Appreciation Society? Yes, he is. Yeah, and he's got the subject of Oscar Wilde? I didn't have it. <laughs> Tim had the subject, but lost it. <laughs> yes, true, actually, yeah. That's true. <laughs> He hadn't really got going yet. No, no, he hadn't got going. No, not at all, no. And if you know a lot nice. about it, you're quite likely to repeat it somehow. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, an incorrect challenge, yeah. Giles. 49 seconds available. Oscar Wilde starting now. His parents were Sir William Wilde, who was an oculist, and a lady called Constanza. There was a brother known as Willie and a sister, Azola, who died when quite young. Also, there were half-siblings, two of whom... Uh, Esther Chance. Surely the subject is not Oscar Wilde's entire family. Uh, well, it's a minute to fill, and I'm giving the story of Oscar Wilde. <laughs> I'm giving a context so important. Mm. And you, I think, are somebody as to appreciate the significance of family life. But, uh, Esther, he did <laughs> I think the quality of his parenting, Esther, is something you've talked about a great deal over the last 40 years or so. <laughs> Just give Wilde a break. If we'd given more time and attention to this, the story might have ended more happily. <laughs> he did repeat there were. There were. You repeated there were. <laughs> <laughs> so, Esther, we want to hear from you on this. As well as, I agree with Paul, taking it away from Giles, because he is, uh, it is one of his pet subjects. 33 seconds, Esther. Oscar Wilde, starting now. Speaking of family, I have a great five times aunt who actually was involved in Oscar Wilde's life. She was married to a diamond merchant called Ernest Leveson. Oh, yes, uh, yes. Paul Janish. Well, this has come off the subject of Oscar Wilde. Hold on. Ada Leveson, yeah. who was married to Ernest Leveson... Who is not who, Oscar Wilde. ..who was my great five times aunt, was a close friend of Oscar Wilde. And Darling, when he, you oh, had... Right, so, so she, she, was, she wasn't Oscar Wilde. But then. when he went... <laughs> He went to Reading Jail. She was the only society hostess oh, right. that actually yeah. continued to really um, uh, yeah, involve. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, as, as the president sounds, of the Oscar Wilde Society, character. can I step in here yeah. mm, to say that Esther is absolutely right. The yeah. Levisons were a key part of the Oscar Wilde mm. story, yeah, so but it's interesting. But Giles, yeah. the point uh, is, it's possibly more Radio Three on a Thursday. <laughs> yeah, but nonetheless, marvelous to bring it into the mainstream like this. <laughs> And I have to try and be as fair as I can within the rules of just a minute. You hadn't got to the subject of Oscar Wilde within about 20 seconds of which you've been going. So actually, Paul has a correct challenge. And he has 22 seconds on Oscar Wilde starting now. Winston Churchill was talking to Bobby Moore and he said, look, there's Jimmy Greaves over there. <laughs> Walt Disney walked in front of Bobby Moore. Bill Crosby and Bill Taylor, all fans of Oscar Wilde. Genuine challenge. That had nothing to do with Oscar Wilde until he no. desperately, after the challenge, brought yeah, I, Oscar I, I, Wilde into yeah. the conversation. But I think you were making a very astute point. I was there, getting round to it. Yes. <laughs> so, Tim, a correct challenge. 18 seconds still available. Oscar Wilde starting now. Oscar Wilde had a very famous brother called Marty, who in turn had an <laughs> extremely celebrated daughter called Kim. And every. 
Deviation. Yeah, it, it reminds me of his brother. How do you know which Oscar Wilde I was talking about? <laughs> well, we've Marty assumed... Marty Wilde has a brother called Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> who lives in Stevenage. Yeah. I don't think you're correct. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. And say there's ten seconds. Esther, Oscar Wilde, starting now. So poor old Oscar was sent to Reading Jail for not committing a crime, but just because certain members of the aristocracy took against him. And when he came out of that particular... <laughs> Professor Manson was then speaking as the whistle when gained that extra point, and she has increased her lead at the end of that round, ahead of the other three, who are almost equal in second place. And, uh, Paul, we have a lot of this subject in this game, the Blarney Stone. So that's the subject. Tell us something about it in 60 seconds, if you can, starting now. The Blarney Stone is situated about six, seven miles outside of Cork. And tradition goes that if you lay on your back and stick your head towards the Blarney Stone and kiss it, that somehow good luck will accrue to you. It's not a particularly easy position to adopt, because the Blarney Stone is situated in such a way that it's not a case of... <coughs> Esther Towns. Was there... A repetition of situated, or did I make that up? Oh, God, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> did you say it was situated outside Cork, and did, then did you say...? Yeah. You did, indeed. Well, listen, Esther. And uh, you've got in with 42 seconds on the Blarney Stone starting now. I've always thought it very unfair that the Irish seem to have the gift of eloquence. When you look across broadcasting, so many of our finest... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tim Challenge. Hesitation. Hesitation. Total collapse the there. Party. So yeah. you got in on the Blarney Stone, Tim, with 32 seconds to go, starting now. The Blarney Stone is in Ireland. I've never been anywhere near the Blarney Stone, but fortunately, the people near me have, and I've learnt an awful lot in <coughs> just. Esther Challenge. Were there two nears there? Never been near mm, the Blarney good. Stone, yes. and yes. the people near me. Oh, very very good. Good. Oh, the gloves are off. <laughs> She's had her baptism of yeah, fire. That's it. It's all over now. Yes. <laughs> 23 seconds with you, Esther, on the Blarney it's Stone. It's hardly worth starting, Esther. Hardly <laughs> worth starting. <laughs> OK. Go on, give Giles a bonus point. We enjoyed that. <laughs> Esther, you've got a point. You have the Blarney Stone. 23 seconds, starting now. Oscar Wilde was, of course, an Irishman, and so is Terry Wogan. And what links them is this wonderful lyrical eloquence. Giles is challenged. Repetition of lyrical from earlier. Yes, it was lyrical before. Just goes to show, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Just goes to show that now, Esther, this is personal. So, Giles, a correct challenge. 16 seconds, the Blarney Stone, starting now. I was recently asked to be the new face of the Stanner Stairlift commercial. I said no, but when the Irish Tourist Board called, inviting me to be the person to examine and then exemplify the best of what the Blarney Stone has to offer, I leapt at the opportunity. This is the kind of... So, Giles Brandy, speaking as a whistle when gain that extra point... And we are moving into the final round. Oh. I'll give you the score as it stands at the moment. Paul Merton, who usually comes out on top, he's struggling a little. He's one point behind Tim Rice, who is one point behind Giles Brandreth, who's one point behind Esther Ransom. In other words, one point separates all four of them in that oh. sequence. And who is it to begin? Giles. Giles, the subject is the Grand Old Duke of York, starting now. The Grand Old Duke of York, the original royal bipolar member of the family. Because when he was up, of course, that's where he was. The figure that in history is regarded as being the Grand Old Duke of York was probably Frederick, Duke of York, during the Napoleonic Wars, the son of King George III, who had a wonderful dress sense, which you can enjoy if you go to the Duke of York steps, which are at the foot of Lower Regent Street. Uh, Paul Challenge. There was a very slight hesitation. There was a hesitation, slight, Paul. But, uh... So you got in with 31 seconds to go on the Grand Old Duke of York, starting now. The old pub stood on the corner for many years, but then one day it was demolished, brick by partition. <laughs> fell down. The regulars who used to hang around the public bar wiped a tear from their face. They remembered the days... Giles Challenge. The regulars would have more than one face unless it was a very strange-looking person. <laughs> the regulars wiped the tears from their face. Yes. Their faces is correct. No, there's a lot of inbreeding. 
<laughs> Everybody looked the same. Deviation from correct use of English. Yes, yes, very much. All right, I give you the benefit of the doubt. 14 seconds. The Grand Old Duke of York, Giles, starting now. Curiously, the original nursery rhyme of the Grand Old Duke of York predates the Duke of York of which we are speaking and goes back to about 1409 and probably relates to a Grand Old Duke from the country of France. So Giles Brandreth was in speakers of Whistle Wayne, gained that extra point, and I will give you the final score. It's very clear. They're all almost equal. In second place, equal, was Paul Merton and Tim Rice, but only two points ahead, equal, were Giles Brandreth and Esther Ransom. Oh. So they're the winners. So it only remains for me to say thank you to these four fine competitive players of the game, Paul Merton, Tim Rice, Giles Brandreth and Esther Ransom. I thank Hayley Sterling, who's helped me with the score, blown her whistle with such style after the 60 seconds elapsed. We thank our producer, Victoria Lloyd. We're indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this amazing game. And we're very grateful to this lovely audience here, who've cheered us on our way magnificently. So from them, from me, Nicholas Parsons, thank you. Tune in again the same time when we play Just a Minute. Welcome to Just a Minute. <laughs> Parsons. And as the minute walls fade away once more, it's my huge pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country, but around the world, but to welcome to the program four exciting, dynamic people who are going to show their skill with words and language as they try and speak on the subject that I give them, and they try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. And they are seated on my right, Stephen Fry and Josie Lawrence, and seated on my left, Jenny Eclair and Nish Kumar. Will you please welcome all four of them? Beside me sits Hayley Sterling, who's going to run the stopwatch for me and help me with the score, and she'll blow the whistle when the 60 seconds have elapsed. As we begin the show with Jenny Eclair, and who better? Jenny, a vintage year. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. The year I was born was vintage, <laughs> like a fine wine, full-bodied, characterful and fruity, also with a tannin bitter aftertaste. I can leave people with a familiar feeling of a hangover, like an Alsatian has bitten the back. Well, seem a new challenge. It was like, a couple of likes, like yeah. just now, and then oh, there was yes. like a fine wine yeah. earlier. I think like also wine. I was talking rubbish. Well, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I'd like to thank you, Amiable Stephen, rubbish. from but, but saving there's, me there's from national the humiliation. <laughs> Jenny, there's nothing in the rules of the game which says you can't talk rubbish, <laughs> provided you keep going without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. Uh, Stephen, a correct challenge, so you get a point for that, and you take over the subject. There are 40 seconds still available, a vintage year starting now. When I was 17, it was a very good year. That's what <laughs> Frank Sinatra, 100 years old this year, said. Uh, actually, it wasn't. Uh, oh, I, this uh, challenge. Yeah, Hesitation. Yeah. Why? Yeah, yeah, he yeah. said, ah. You're cruel, yes, but yes. fair. Yeah. <laughs> this is a correct challenge. You have 31 seconds if you need it. And the subject is a vintage year starting now. I would argue 1985 was a vintage year. Why? Because it was the year I was born and myself has done. <laughs> That's what this show does to you. As long as you don't overdo it, as long as you don't overdo it, Nish, you can say the word I more than once. Okay. It wasn't that, it was your lovely use of language, which is, so it says, here's a way it gets you, doesn't it? But uh, who challenged? Josie, you challenged first, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, hesitation. Hesitation. Yeah. Yes, Myself has done. Um, yeah. Right, uh, Josie, um, 21 seconds are still available. A vintage year starting now. A vintage year, a year that you remember as being totally successful and beautiful in your mind. My vintage year, although there are quite a few, must be when I was a student at Dartington College of Arts, leaving my parents behind and growing into the woman you see. <laughs> Oh, Josie, 
It was getting very emotional. We were speaking as the whistle went, and in this game, whoever is as that gains an extra point. So, Josie, you've got the lead at the end of the round. And Nish, we'd like you to begin the next round. Russian dolls. Do you have any at home, by the way? I, do, I, I don't know. And I think this uh, next minute could be very interesting. I say minute. That's a very generous uh, uh, summation. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. Right. Russian dolls. 60 seconds if you want it. Nish, starting now. Russian dolls. Dolls that are Russian. <laughs> dolls within dolls. Dolls inside dolls. <laughs> dolls from Russia. <laughs> a country. I think that deserves a bonus point for the way you kept going. <laughs> but, Jenny, you challenged... A repetition uh, of Russia. <laughs> oh, yes, this is uh, Russian dolls. Russia. And you speak it Russia, Russia rather than Russian. Right, well, listen, Jenny, Petty right. of me, but, you know... <laughs> Jenny, can you... You really saved me. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of your mother listening to this, <laughs> sobbing in her kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> He was a bright boy. <laughs> oh, Nish! I think it was very bright to do what you did and keep going. The audience loved it. 46 seconds available, Jenny. Russian dolls starting now. These were quite a fad back in my school days, and many of my chums had them lined up on their window sills. I <laughs> craved Russian dolls. Mummy, please. But my mother, northern quite hard, said, make your own out of toilet rolls, girl. <laughs> Use your imagination. So I did. And all on my bedside table, there was a collection of lavatory holder Russian dolls painted just like the wooden originals, actually done with, um... Oh! Oh! oh, oh I forgot the word! The belt I was back there. So, I was back Nish, there. you oh. challenge first. Yes. You oh, really uh, want the subject, because you've got it. Hesitation. Yeah, hesitation. I want it. I feel more ready for it than ever. <laughs> well, Three seconds left. you've only got seven seconds, so you're yeah. all right. Yeah. Uh, Russian Dolls, back with you, Nish, starting now. Russian Dolls. <laughs> dolls that are Russian. <laughs> dolls inside dolls. <laughs> Nish, no one's ever done that before. When they've got back in, repeated what they've said before. <laughs> There's nothing in the rules that says you can't do that. Anyway, Nish, you were speaking when the whistle went. You're now in the lead. Oh, oh, Nish, would... Nish, Nish, yourself done good. <laughs> Josie, we'd like you to begin the next round. The subject, oh, a nice erudite one, Homer. Tell us something about that Greek um, poet, or character, whatever you want to call him, starting now. Homer is one of my favourite literary heroes. He has the ability to take you to fantastical lands and a unique way with words. I often quote Homer. Here's a few. Mmm, donuts. <laughs> Woohoo! And, of course... Do. He has a family. Marge, his long-suffering wife, Bart, his son, and Lisa and Maggie, the daughters. He has never written the Iliad or the Odyssey because he's two-dimensional and wouldn't be able to hold a pen. <laughs> Bart is... Oh, uh. Uh. Stephen, you chance. Oh, I'm Bart, two Barts, I'm afraid. Yes. I was great, yes. though. I meant to say yeah. Homer. Yeah. I know, uh. you did. But anyway, listen, um, Stephen... You've got him with 19 seconds to go on Homer, starting now. No one actually knows who the poet Homer really was, mm. when he exactly lived, or even if he could write. There's a strong theory that it was the oral tradition that was passed on to subsequent generations who then wrote down the epic poems we know as the Iliad and Odyssey. <laughs> Yeah. It's lovely having on the show. We get so much interesting erudite information, Stephen. And you kept going to the whistle when again, that extra point for doing so. And you're in second place behind Nish. And, and it's also your turn to begin. And the subject is my first flat, oh. starting now. 
was 48 Draycott Place SW3. How lucky I was to be able to live in such a swish part of London. Very few who left university would now be able to have such accommodation, I'm sorry to say. Also, you could argue my first flat happened on the M11. Awfully embarrassing. I think I may have run over a nail or some other sharp object which punctured the inner tube and caused me no end of inconvenience. What do you do? Well, on television, I'd seen people jacking up their automobiles and attempting to undo the nuts and replace with a spare, but I didn't really have any full acquaintance as to how this worked. It seemed to be a mystery. My first flat was really a nightmare. It was a terrible thing. I waved my hand by the side of the motorway, asking people if they could help. Very few did, until a kind gentleman eventually stopped and demonstrated to me the art of... <laughs> Stephen, did you know that you can take out insurance for that? And uh, there's, there's a big organisation which you has got... You could join the AA, but obviously you couldn't mention it in a round of just a minute. No! <laughs> can you imagine? True. AA. I know. Oh, yes. And they would have come to help you, Stephen. I can well, recommend that you, you do that. Thank you for that. I'll remember uh, that. Because uh, I can't see him putting a spare wheel on very well. No. Um, <laughs> so, Stephen, you were speaking when the whistle went, you gained an extra point. You've taken the lead ahead of Nish and Josie and Jenny. And Jenny, <laughs> we're with you to begin. And the subject is The Tale of Peter Rabbit. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. The Tale of Peter Rabbit was written and illustrated by Beatrix Potter, a woman who lived in the Lake District, talented writer and painter. The fa fable, tall oh. tale, tale. Nish. You challenge first. Hesitation. You're yeah. interpreting the hesitation. The yeah. So you've got another point, Nish, and you're moving forward, and you've got the tale of Peter Rabbit, and there's 47 seconds if you want it starting now. The tale of Peter Rabbit is white and fluffy. <laughs> As with a lot of rabbits, regardless of whether or not they are named Peter, it is near the back of the animal and is very often used to illustrate happiness in an animal, say a dog. For oh, Stephen Challenge. Yeah, another animal there. Another animal. I mean, I was on thin ice as I opened my mouth. <laughs> Is it not called a scut? Scut, yes, anyway, good word. I yeah. think you'll find it's called a scut. <laughs> <laughs> She's pleased with that. Oh, right. <laughs> you might get in again, Jenny, you can use that. Um, 29 seconds for you, Stephen, and another point, of course. The Tale of Peter Rabbit, starting now. What do I remember of the tale of Peter Rabbit? Flopsy, Mopsy and Cottontail, mm. the siblings of Peter Rabbit, of course. The gardener, whose name was McGregor, who was very much Ooh. the enemy. I recall lettuce as being a soporific, which caused them to fall asleep. Very touching. The drawings were marvellous. Beatrix Potter herself, as has been said, deeply talented woman, not just as a children's illustrator and author, but uh, a... Oh. Oh. <laughs> Just before the whistle went, you Dull. heard, yes. Nish, you got in first. Hesitation. Uh, yes. yes, no question. And you've got him with two seconds to go. <laughs> oh. Not pop. It. it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm sure you've got something to say in two seconds on the tale of Peter Rabbit starting now. The tale of Peter Rabbit. <laughs> So Nish, our second time player of the game, uh, got a point for speaking as the whistle went, and he's moved forward. He's taken the lead, one ahead of Stephen Fry. <laughs> <laughs> and Nish, we're back with you to begin, and the subject now is my first love. Can you Aww. tell us something about that? Who said ah? I did. Oh. <laughs> She's still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I don't know who we're saying R for. <laughs> anyway, my first love is a subject niche. 60 seconds <clears throat> starting now. <clears throat> my first love was an unusual lass. Her name, Buffy Summers. Her <laughs> occupation, vampire slayer. She lived in Sunnydale, a town, whilst fictional, that was still lovely and sunny. She was so... <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, you challenged. Lots of uh, hesitation yeah, and also repetition of the word her twice. I was too pleased with myself that I got Sunnydale and Sunny in, <laughs> and I was sort of hoping someone was going to... But then I, no. I looked like an absolute idiot. 
Jenny, you've gone in first. <coughs> there is hesitation. And you have 43 seconds available. My first love starting now. My first love appeared on a screen in front of my eyes when I was eight years old and recently returned from four years in Berlin where... <coughs> Josie Chan. Repetition of years. Oh, yes. Eight years and years. You're oh, absolutely oh, right. Well spotted. Oh. Well spotted. <laughs> oh. Well, seeing as I've never been in love, I've got absolutely nothing to say. <laughs> I'll have to make something up. Oh. <laughs> You're too <laughs> modest, darling. I think a lot of viewers <clears throat> and uh, people in the theatre have fallen in love with you across the footlights, I'm sure. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, if I wasn't otherwise promised, you could be one of my loves. <laughs> uh, 34 seconds available for you, Josie. My first love starting now. Actually, my first love was a young lad in primary school called Kenneth Barnsley, and I loved him because he gave me a purse. On one side it was suede, and on the other... Ah, it... uh, Jenny Challenge. Repetition. Uh, not repetition, sorry. I've got to use the wrong word. I mm. meant it was a terrible hesitation. That's yes, right, it was. Tried to... um, <laughs> 23 seconds are still available, Jenny. My first love starting now. Top of the Pops. 7 o'clock, Thursday night, who did I see? Peter Noon from Herman's Hermits. Blonde and toothy, that was it. A god amongst men. All I remember doing was feeling this sensation of warmth and taking my socks off. What on earth was going on? This was even... <laughs> so Jenny was then speaking as a whistle when gained that extra point, she's moved forward. <laughs> She's still in third place, but she's moved. Uh, she's one ahead of Josie. And uh, Stephen, you're in second place, one behind Nish Kumar, who's Ooh. still on the lead. <laughs> so, Josie, we're what? back with you to begin. And the subject now is Plymouth Rock. Oh, my Lord. Tell us something about that historic place in this game, starting now. The famous Plymouth Rock is not a sticky, sugary stick that has the word Plymouth going through it, or a band that does the pubs around Plymouth and plays heavy metal. No, the f oh, blum. <laughs> Seaman, oh, oh, trying word. to avoid famous again. I know. That was a bit of a. Yeah. I know. I, I, so, mm. Seaman, you've gone in first. It's not that famous. I've never heard of it. Oh, I, I've heard of it. No, mm. but well, I can't tell you now because yeah. I'm Stephen. <laughs> well, we'll find out from Stephen. He probably knows. <laughs> Forty-five seconds. Uh, Plymouth Rock, Stephen, starting now. Oh, well, the verse to "Anything Goes" by Cole Porter begins in times have changed in the Puritans landing on Plymouth Rock. Uh, it landed on them. Oh, yeah. niche challenge. Uh, hesitation. Yeah, yes, and he landed, oh, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, we give you the hesitation, shocking. and he'll give you thirty-six seconds if you need it. <laughs> Plymouth Rock, Nish, starting now. I don't know anything about Plymouth Rock, but what I do want to say is I cannot believe I'm leading so far. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're not leading now. <laughs> Jenny, you challenged first. I could walk into that gap. <laughs> and I'm a big girl. Uh. So hesitation. Yeah. Jenny, you have 28 seconds if you need it. Plymouth Rock starting now. I know nothing about Plymouth Rock, but I know Plymouth Rocks. Oh, Stephen Challenge. Uh, two knows. You knew I know too much, nothing, darling. but I know. I know, I know. Oh, yeah, I'm very glad. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, 24 seconds. Tell us more about Plymouth Rock starting now. Well, there's an argument that Plymouth Rock is a recent addition to the mythology of the Mayflower and the arrival of the Puritans in America in the 17th century. It's in Massachusetts. There is a museum which has a piece of it. I've touched it myself, making a programme on the subject of the United States, as it happens. Americans have this view of the Plymouth business as being somehow very much a part of who they are and what they're... <laughs> so, Stephen Fry was in speaking the wish for wind. Gained that extra point and he's moved forward. He's now one ahead of our previous leader, Nish Kumar. And, um... And his... Hubris, thy name is Kumar. <laughs> <laughs> and quite a few ahead of uh, Josie Lawrence and Jenny Eclair. And, uh, Stephen, we're back with you to begin. Mm. The subject, a very simple one, the fish finger. So if you want to write it down, that's fine. <laughs> the fish finger, 60 seconds, starting now. Well, I believe these entered the British kitchen round about the 1950s. Cod, place, haddock, 
gurnard. Those sorts of whitefish were the constituents of something that I have to confess I've never actually enjoyed or tasted. I know you'll hate me. It's the same with brown sauce. Uh, who's challenged? Jenny, yes. Uh, deviation, how would he know he doesn't like them if he hasn't tasted one? <laughs> Who doesn't like them? You said I don't like them and I haven't even tasted them. I don't like the look of them. I think they look horrible. They, you did, I just you don't didn't like establish them. that. They look greasy and unpleasant. You said I didn't have time. Someone pressed a buzzer. I don't like them or, uh, and I've never tasted them and I don't want to because uh, the reason I He's don't like them is because I'm disgusted. He's talking himself out of it again, Nicholas. He did this last time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember? Listen, I know. I throw myself on the mercy of the court. I understand. <laughs> I, I, I don't like hanging out of a tall building, but I've We've never, never tried it. it. Exactly. <laughs> Why are you supporting him? I, was about I to have give it no to idea. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, I think I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to Jenny. Yes. Because yes. I think you did convey she what you were saying, that you didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, uh, you were talking about tasting all the time and then said you didn't like them. So it's logical that we should have thought, well, if he doesn't like them, how could he have tasted them all? So, Jenny, benefit of the doubt, a point to you, 41 seconds, the fish finger starting now. One of the compensations of motherhood is hoovering up your children's cold, leftover fish fingers. There is nothing more delicious. It is ambrosia from the gods. Pallid, sloppy, with tomato ketchup, couple of peas stuck on the top. Oh, yes. In fact, I have snatched fish fingers from the mouth of my child. <laughs> <laughs> Josie Lawrence, you child. Now, I'm going to be naughty here. Oh, was yeah. it the fish finger or fish fingers? It because is, the subject is It's a repetition fish finger. of fingers. Oh. Yes. Oh. Nuanced. The nuanced. subject yeah. is the yeah. fish finger. Challenge. And you were talking about fish fingers. How so dare I? It. <laughs> <laughs> and Josie yeah, was did. listening well, yeah. so she's got him with a point, of course, and 15 seconds available. The fish finger. Josie, starting now. I love the fish finger, especially between two pieces of white bread. Used to live on it when I was a student. Also, my friend had a really good recipe for fish finger pie, which basically involved... <laughs> <laughs> So, Josie Lawrence will then speak as a whistle win, gain that extra point, and she has moved forward. She's still in fourth place, but she's moved. And, uh, <laughs> but she's only one point behind Jenny, and she's only two points behind Nish, and three points behind Stephen. And we're back with you, Jenny, to begin, and another erudite subject, Pride and Prejudice. 60 seconds are starting now. Written, of course, by Jane Austen. This has been turned from book to film and TV series. Unfortunately, I get confused between these genres. I know it's about five Bennet girls who all need marrying off. Their mother's desperate to get these girls off her hands. I know. Oh, yes. yes. Stephen. Girls. Girls, I'm girls. afraid. Yeah, too many girls. girls. Yes, there were yes. a lot of girls in the Pride and Prejudice, but can't All with a heaving bosom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Only in the film. <laughs> <laughs> right. 37 seconds, Stephen. You've got him with a correct challenge, <laughs> so you have a point. You have the subject of Pride and Prejudice starting now. It is, I think, a testament to the extraordinary quality of Jane Austen's writing that ask people what Darcy looks like, and they'll all say he's dark. She never describes him physically at all. It's something to do with his character. The novel was first written as an epistolary book, rather like Sense and Sensibility, her first published work. And then she called it First Impressions. A good title, but not as good as Pride and Prejudice. That's the one that lives on, isn't it? For many people, the book they would take to their, you know, desert island, that sort of place, because it Somehow, it's the first book that really... Oh, oh yeah. Josie yeah. Challenge. I'm so sorry. No, Repetition of book. Book, you're right, yeah. Yes, absolutely. right. And uh, so a correct challenge, Josie. You've got him with five seconds to go. <laughs> Pride and Prejudice, starting now. Why did Jane Austen call it Pride and Prejudice? Well, Darcy was... <laughs> <up> <laughs> Well, I just had a message that we're moving into the final round. Oh, oh you're a lovely <laughs>
at this particular moment as we move into the final round. Let me tell you, it's very, very close. They've all got lots of points. But Jenny's only just in fourth place, one point behind Josie Lawrence, who's one point behind Nish Kumar, and he's two points behind Stephen Fry. And Nish, it's your turn to begin. And the subject now is a lovely subject, a penny for your thoughts. Tell us something about that phrase in this game, starting now. A penny for your thoughts. <laughs> for your thoughts, a penny. <laughs> penny thoughts for your. <laughs> can I buzz myself? You can, so you buzz yourself. What's your challenge? Absolute nonsense. <laughs> oh, no, careful. You can talk nonsense in this show. But if you hesitate, so you did hesitate, didn't you? Yeah, I did hesitate, because well, even the... I couldn't believe those words were coming out of my own face. <laughs> so, Nish, yep. th that was... So have I successfully challenged myself? Yes, you have to... <laughs> yes you've challenged yourself. This is incredible. It's not it's a thing a we en... this, this is like Doctor thing... Strange, love. <laughs> it's not a thing we encourage, <laughs> but it's a correct challenge. <laughs> So, I give you a point for a correct challenge. <laughs> and say, well listened. Uh, and you 49 seconds if you want it. And I try a different tack at this time. <laughs> a penny for your thoughts, starting now. A penny for your thoughts, my dear mother, as you sit here listening to me talk absolute nonsense on Radio 4's Just A Minute, broadcast on the Double BC. <laughs> <laughs> Even. Such a brilliant uh, avoidance of re repeating B that he then know, just fell silent into a just hesitation. The show, they warned them. One of the errors that a lot of first people step into is they use the word BBC because it's so natural, and you are repeating B. So they warned Nish about this before they do it. So he gets that, and of course he pauses. So proud. So, uh, Stephen, you challenge first. Uh, hesitation. There are 37 seconds, um, Stephen. A penny for your thoughts, starting now. Well, a friend of mine who used to write scripts for Coronation Street once told me that if he didn't know how to begin a scene, a great way to do so was to have Bet or someone else at the bar say to her cohort, a uh, penny for them, love, and she'd go, what? Your thoughts. And she'd go, oh, sorry, Chuck, I were miles away. And they actually have about 20 scenes that begin exactly like that in that particular series. It's something that... Jenny challenge. Begin twice. Yes. Nice. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, Jenny, you've got in with the correct challenge. And there are 13 seconds still available. A penny for your thoughts starting now. There is nothing more annoying than somebody interrupting your thought process and saying, a penny for your thoughts. At this point, I want to say, do you know what? I'm thinking you're a really... <laughs> So let me give you the final score. Oh, it's all so close. They're all so talented and so funny. Right. But in fourth place was Josie Lawrence. And she's one point behind Jenny Eclair, who's one point behind Nish Kumar. And he was one point behind Stephen Fry. So we say, Stephen, you are the winner this week. So it only remains to say thank you to these four fine players of the game, Stephen Fry, Josie Lawrence, Nish Kumar and Jenny Eclair. I thank uh, Hayley Sterling, who's helped me with the score. She's blown her whistle beautifully. And uh, we're indebted to our producer, Victoria Lloyd. And we're deeply indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this amazing game. We're indebted to this lovely audience here in the Radio Theatre, who've cheered us on our way magnificently. So from our audience, from me, Nicholas Parsons and the team, goodbye, thank you, and tune in again when we play... Just a minute! <laughs>